Guess what day it is? Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday and welcome to the opening drive on 101 ESPN in St. Louis, where it's 7 o'clock. Time check brought to you by Clarkson Jewelers, an officially licensed Rolex jeweler. Brooke Grimsley is here. Dan McLaughlin is here. Matthew Rocchio is here. And hey, buddy, we're here. There we go. <laughs> here come your St. Louis Blues. How about that last night? Whew. Randy, you had a bold prediction for the Blues this morning? Oh, uh, well, yeah. It kind of feels like 2019 all over again to me. It's, oh, uh, goodness. Kind of, kind of feels Stanley Cupish. <laughs> yeah. Go win the Blues. Yeah. Go they're, marching. They're marching in right now. It's happening. Dan, what do you think? Blues, I'm just listening. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt. <laughs> oh, you don't. No, you, you don't interrupt. You don't want to interrupt the kid? Correct. Okay. Uh huh. Four nil last night. You guys excited? Brooke was there. I was there. Be in that number when the blues go marching in. St. Louis Symphony Orchestra. Your St. Louis Blues scoreless after a period last night at the Enterprise Center against the New York Islanders, who have won four Stanley Cups, by the way. Granted, it was 1980, <laughs> 81, 82, and 83, but they still won four Stanley Cups. Not too long ago. <laughs> <laughs> so scoreless after a period, and then 4.38 into the second period, a little bit of an avalanche from the Blues. Shen to the far side. They in the middle. They shoot. Score! Wide open was Brandon Saad. Power play goal. Blues have a one nothing lead. 2-0. They score! They come right in off the next draw and find Pavel Butch Namich in the middle. Thomas with a head of steam gets it over the line. It's the trailer. Kairou to the far wing. They score! Butch Navich! Two in a hurry. And the St. Louis Blues have made it 3 nothing with 14.50 to go here in period number two. A record three goals in 32 seconds. Blues record three goals in 32 seconds. Bucci actually got a hat trick with an empty netter, took himself off the trade block, and the Blues win it by a score of 4-0. That was so exciting. I was at the game last night. Not saying that I'm a good luck charm, but what? maybe. I think so. Maybe. Yeah. But we were standing after that first sod goal, and then we were still standing, and then it was like, wait a minute. What just happened? <laughs> Did we just score? And then you're celebrating. It's like, wait a minute. What just happened again? It was such a fun and great moment. Great overall game. It's hard to really pinpoint who was the best player on the ice because there's so many guys. You could talk about Jordan Bennington with 38 saves. And, of course, a shutout last night. The, I believe it was the fourth of the season for him. And then you had the franchise best three goals in 32 seconds. Buchnevich with the hat trick. And then you had Jordan Cairo. Honestly, I thought it was one of his best games of the season and Robert Thomas with three helpers. It was really hard to point to who was the best player on the ice last night. And that's a good thing. And we'll visit with Robert Thomas here on the show. He's coming up in our number eight. No, nine. 9 a.m. He'll be part of the show. How about Jordan Bennington now? He's 137 in terms of wins. Does it shock you that's third all time in Blues history? He's tied with Cujo now. And you think about it, 19. 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. He's in his sixth season now. Yeah. So uh, he has been, with with all due respect to everybody else, and Lee was in a different era. It was a different animal. So you can't compare numbers now to then. But Jordan Bennington is one of the those three that you mentioned. They're the three best goalies the Blues have ever had. I thought he was awesome yes. last night. Now, the three goals in the time frame that they had is exciting. I also enjoyed the referee saying, you're not going to like this. <laughs> Did you see that? Guys? That was so great. Was have great. you ever watched the show Shorzy? 
Do you guys know what not. I'm talking about? Uh, no. So it was very Shorzy esque, which is something that a lot of people pointed out. It's just kind of a hockey funny show, but it, it was very Shorzy esque of him to do that. And it was all in one moment. You knew it was coming, and then he said that. So everybody was booing, but also kind of laughing at the <laughs> exact. And that's what I was doing. I was booing, but I was also laughing because it was hilarious. Um, but it was it was such a great ja a game. And you mentioned Jordan Bington, and I just want to correct myself. It was his third shutout of the mm -hmm. season. But there were so many breakaway chances that the Islanders had, but he was just so rock solid all night. I thought the special teams was the difference in the game, too. They had the penalty kill, then all of a sudden the three goals. Part of that was going on the power play. So it was it was a great game all around for the Blues. Buchnevich, boy, if you're trying to trade him last night, doesn't hurt. Now, I would imagine that teams have a pretty good idea of what they think he might be if they had to pull off a deal and what he might look like with your team. But you get the hat trick, and that certainly helps. Um, I really, I thought it was interesting where Patrick Waugh wound up uh, pulling his goalie with 11 minutes to yeah. go. Unreal. Yeah. I think more teams probably need to do that. It, I think strategically it made some sense. You're on the road. You're going on the power play. You might as well go for it. What? What the hell? Go for it in that situation. Well, yeah, and then score a goal, and then all of a sudden you've got the most dangerous lead in hockey, right? A, a two-goal lead is the most dangerous it lead. It is. Right? So, but, yeah, you can if you score and you're down two with ten minutes left, you might as well take your shot because if you're down three at the end of the power play or four, you're not going to win anyway. Well, fans are saying, now, wait a minute, we scored three in 30-plus seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a fan of the St. Louis Blues, maybe they could do it. No. The, the, the strategy, I thought, uh, is something that was interesting because you rarely see it, but it makes a lot of sense. I want to go back to Buchnevich because we already got a text in this morning because a lot of people are talking about that, about if he's on the trade block or not. Took himself off the trade block? No, I just it just upped the price. Can you imagine Pittsburgh with him on the second line? Did his price go up, guys? Because we were discussing it yesterday where maybe Doug Armstrong possibly, that was just some of the rumors that Elliot Friedman had put out there that he was asking for potential, you know, a higher pick or something like that. A 30-year-old, well, he's going to be 30 when his contract is up, who has never been a star in the playoffs, uh, who's already has an asking price of two number ones, uh, no, you aren't going to get more for Buchnevich. Buchnevich isn't going to draw more than the Kings got for Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I would say that it, it doesn't hurt like before when I was talking about it. But if he gets hot and they've got eight of nine on the road coming up, mm, yeah. then it makes it a little bit different if you're trying to go for the cup and going for broke. But it certainly doesn't hurt. Three goals last night. One was the empty netter and a uh, fun game to watch. We were discussing this because I tried to take David's hat. David was wearing a hat last night, my fiance, and I was going to try to throw it out on the ice. And I know not everybody does, but what is a, ha a hat that you are not going to part with? Like, what is the price wise? Well, hats generally are 32, between 32 and 40 bucks. So I, I probably will. Uh, and I wouldn't wear one of my golf hats. I'd wear a blues hat to a blues game. But am I going to throw my Blues Stanley Cup champions cap on the ice for a hat trick? No chance. A lot uh, of John Deere uh, hats yeah. made it on the ice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you get those instead of your championship hat there, Randy. Right. And those maybe the, that's why those people are wearing their John Well, all due respect to John Deere, maybe that's why those people are wearing the John Deere caps. Because you can get one from our friends at uh, Seed and Stricker Noby, and it doesn't cost $32. That's the thing, is that if it's a certain price, I can see that it is pretty expensive. I mean, not everybody throws their hat out on the ice, but do you almost bring a hat in preparation of hoping that you'll be able to throw it out on the ice? I think it's a bad omen. You got to take the hat that yeah. uh, you got on your head, and that's what you do. <laughs> but uh, I love that part in hockey. I'd, I'd throw a hat. I'd have no problem with it. Really? Yeah, no problem. You guys see me every day, though. I wear the same hat uh -huh. every day, yeah. so I'll throw it. Maybe I need a new one. Well, th that's true. Now, here's the other thing. <laughs> Actually, I have two yeah. hats that I wear here. <clears throat> so this one already, the logo yeah, the is gone. Yeah, been washed off. So maybe I should yeah. throw this hat out <laughs> in the trash. Would you Would you throw it out on the ice? Say that you wore it yeah. to the game. Yeah, for sure. I would too. I, I would have. I think my kids would pull it off my head and say, "Dad, I need a hat." So they would just yank it off my head and throw it. <laughs> See, here's the thing: if I'm wearing a hat to a hockey game. It's in the rotation, and I don't want to get rid of any hats that are in the rotation. Okay, that's fair. So I why not? Did why you have a hat on, Brooke? I did not, okay. and I kind of wish that I did. From the 636, fan etiquette is that you have to wear a hat you're willing to part with. I think that's true. 
it's part of the sport. You get a hat trick. Uh, if you're a fan, you got to throw it on the ice. What if you're sitting in the 300s? Throw it on the ice. How can you throw it? You can't throw it far enough. Hit somebody on the head, and maybe they <laughs> take <laughs> it, and then they throw, throw it, it on the ice. Okay. Or they just say, oh, this is a nice hat. I'm going to keep this. That's yeah. not good. Okay, that's another thing you don't do. Exactly. Keep a hat from somebody that you don't know who had it previously, who may have, may or may not have had lice. Well, that's what I'm thinking, Randy. I don't, I don't necessarily want to wear that hat of said person that I don't know. Mm-hmm. I just don't want to do it. No, I'm with you. Or somebody that I do know, for that matter. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah. We can want talk my own to, hat. Yeah, we could talk to Curbs and Joey about it, but I was listening to him this morning on the Curbside podcast, and they had a hat that they tried to throw down there, but mm-hmm. they said it didn't make it all the way down, that it landed with some fans, and they were hoping that they would pass it down some more, so... You need to rubber band a rock. So <laughs> That's dangerous. Throw it out of that booth. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's, they get a hat trick, it's a big deal. And you have to have somebody with a good arm. So uh, we're off and running here. Oh, by the way, the uh, Cardinals, uh, they're having some problems with the shortstop position already. We talked about that the other day. Tommy Edmond not ready to go with his wrist issues and Mason Wynn having some arm issues will will apparently not be ready to go until after this weekend. So uh, if not one of those two, is Brendan Donovan your shortstop? I think for the time being, yes, but Unless it does bring up mean. the question of your, oh, or for me, that's a possibility, mm-hmm. but it does bring up a discussion that we were having earlier this week about the infield depth that they have or lack thereof. Go out and get somebody. Yeah, there's people out there. Yeah, there's there's guys that are signing right now, not for a huge amount of money, and if you're pressed and your back is against the wall like that it, towards the end of spring training, then you do it. Long way to go in spring training, and if win is fine by next week when the games get going this weekend, I'm not overly concerned about it. I would think Tommy Edmond is the backup shortstop, though, at this Mm -hmm. point. So then does Dylan Carlson move to center or Lars Newtbar? So they have some options, but another option would be go out and get a veteran, sign him for not a very expensive contract, and he bridges the gap until you get Mason Wynn healthy. Still a few out there. I know Ahmed Rosario signed a couple of days ago, and then Tim Anderson has signed with the Marlins, but there's still a few veteran shortstops out there on the market if indeed the Cardinals are concerned enough about their shortstop depth to go get one. I just don't think think it's yet, though. No. Well, and here's the other thing. We talked about the bench the other day. Who gets displaced from among Carpenter, Herrera, Burleson, Carlson? Uh, Now, obviously, you'd have to have a severe enough injury among one of your shortstops so that you put somebody on the IL. Mm -hmm. But if they aren't severe injuries, who are you displacing on the bench? I don't think you you don't sign a six-year guy to play at Memphis. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, and it's one that the Cardinals are facing right now. I do think that with Mason Wynn, it's just tightness right now. So hopefully it's not anything too severe. But even though it's just spring training, do you have Tommy Edmond be your shortstop for the time being? Because you just know it's temporary, or do you just want to make sure he stays in the outfield? I want him to get a full spring training as much as he can in center field. I also want to see him a little bit at short. I may disagree Mm. with you, but uh, I think you made me put him in two or three games, just a few innings, just to make sure, you know, that he's not acclimated to the position. He knows how to play, but just so he's ready to go if that is the case. Coming up, the Cardinals have so many young players. We talked yesterday about the players that they have that are under 25 that aren't on Major League Baseball's list of the best under 25, but what Cardinals under 30 are capable of being Cardinal Hall of Famers in the future? That's next on 101 ESPN.
Drive on 101 ESPN. Brooke, Dan, and Randy, great to have you with us. And yesterday we talked about the young Cardinal players and how when the Athletic put together a team of players under 25 in Major League Baseball, they put together an all under 25 team, the Cardinals didn't have a representative. Yesterday, the Cardinals announced the four candidates for the Cardinal Hall of Fame, and you'll be able to vote on those candidates coming up uh, in May, and you'll be able to obviously attend the ceremony. It's going to be in September this year. But Steve Carlton, Edgar Renteria, Matt Morris, George Hendrick, all eligible for the Cardinal Hall of Fame. That led to this question. What player or players under 30 do you look at as potential Cardinal Hall of Fame red jacket guys, Daniel? Uh, I'll start. You were said it before the uh, the show, and I agree with it. Nolan Gorman would be my guy just because of the power that he has. Only 23 years old, already with 41 home runs. If you look at an average of that right around 28, 29, he's got over 200 home runs before it'd be all said and done. I think we need to, to describe the eligibility, too. So nominees must have played for the Cardinals for at least three seasons and be retired as a player from Major League Baseball for at least three years. So if he plays, let's say, six years in here uh, and he winds up being a fan favorite with all the home runs, he would probably get in. I like Nolan Gorman a lot. That was one of the first names that I thought of. But, guys, it was a little bit hard, one, finding guys under 30 that I felt like fit Mm -hmm. this category, but also who could potentially do that. Now, I do think that eventually Jordan Walker and Mason Wynn, they have such a bright future, and we've talked about that before. But we're at the very beginning of their career. What about two guys who have won very prestigious or prestigious awards before? Tommy Edmond, who won a gold glove back in 2021. Will he be able to get back to gold glove form? Or what about Ryan Helsley? Now, it's interesting with Ryan Helsley because he said recently that he hopes to get back to all-star form. If you guys remember, he won that he was an all-star in 2022. If he's able to stay healthy, could he be potentially in the mix as one of the Cardinals' best relievers? The key for him is going to be, well, there's going to be two keys. Number one, health. But number two, he's got a pitch. Well, yes. he's and he's got to stick around because the Cardinals, when's the last time the Cardinals had a relief pitcher stick around for more than three years? It, it just doesn't happen with them. It's a fungible asset for the Cardinals. The closer is. You know, we would have thought Jason Mott would have stuck around for a lot longer than he did. He gets hurt. We would have thought Trevor Rosenthal would have stuck around a lot longer than he did. He got hurt. It, I guess... Uh, do we have to go back to Eckersley? No, Izzy, obviously. Izzy is the last Cardinal reliever that really stuck stuck around for any appreciable amount of time. Ryan Helsley is capable of that. He, he throws hard enough. He's got to in, enhance his repertoire. But, yeah, I, I would think that Helsley could be that guy. If he can be the Cardinal closer for five more years, he, he could be a red jacket. Yeah, guy. longevity is yeah. going to have to yes. help him. And, you know, if he's talking about just getting in 60 games and that's being his goal... That's not enough games year in and year out like some of these other closers have have done it. Like Trevor Rosenthal had seasons of 40-plus. He had a 48-save season. He had a 45-save season. And Helsley's talking about pitching in 60 games. One of the things that Rosenthal did is he took the ball. Now, to your point, Brooke, about Tommy Edmond, um, that's interesting. I mean, if they sign him to a long-term deal, which could be on the table at some point this year, it kind of goes into a little bit of the Matt Carpenter territory for me. Mm-hmm. And in my opinion, Matt Carpenter is definitely a Cardinals Hall of Famer before it's all said and done. He'll get voted in. Uh, there are a couple of guys, and we've left out the obvious one here. Everybody believes in the room that ultimately Jordan, Jordan Walker, Walker is yes. going to be a Cardinal right. Hall of Famer, right? He'll be here hopefully for 15 years and be one of the Cardinals' all-time greats. When Mo is saying he's surpassed Tavares, and in Mo's time here, Mo got here in 1995, he says that... Jordan Walker is the Cardinals' best prospect other than Albert Poole. Second best prospect the Cardinals have had. And they've had a lot of prospects. Not that they've had successful prospects all the time, but they've had prospects. But Walker's already done a little bit at the major league level. I think we have to look at Walker and win as possibilities. And another guy, and Dan, we spent several spring trainings having Cardinal people tell us with Andrew Kisner around that our next catcher, the guy that's going to replace Molina is Ivan Herrera. Yep. Mm-hmm. And they've always liked Herrera. I think they were a little surprised in 23, 22 when he came up and he was overwhelmed. Yes. But then last year, he's got a 900 OPS in the minor league level. He looked good when he got here. Uh, I talked to him about it during the winter warm up, and he just reached a comfort level. And 
players need to do that. I would think that with the skill set that is obvious with Yvonne Herrera, he very easily could wind up being a Cardinal Hall of Famer. I agree with you. I think Yvonne Herrera is going to be, it's going to be very exciting to see what he does this season. Now, I want to go to the text line because from the 314, and Dan, this kind of goes with what you were saying when it comes to Ryan Helsley saying he hopes to get to 60 innings. They say analytics will really hurt this age of player when it comes to Hall of Fame convos. Do you guys agree with that? I don't. I actually think it's going to help him. Mm. Um, Ted Simmons has been on record. I, I've talked to him a, a lot about this for a Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. He said, without analytics, I'm not in the Hall of Fame. And I, I do think mm. that voters and young uh, writers and your panel, Randy, will take a harder look at analytics. And that actually will help those that you look at the tr you know traditional stats, home runs, average, runs batted in, but now if you look at OPS, which is what every team is looking for, um, I actually think that can help instead of hurt some of these players that are trying to get into whatever Hall of Fame it may be in baseball. Yeah, it's not going to hurt people. It's just going to change the way that the voting takes place. Tim Raines, another guy. When we look back at his career analytical numbers, he wasn't going to make the Hall of Fame until... Uh, was it was it Dane Perry that uh, was really pitching for him to make it to the Hall of Fame? And he Ryan Spader, too. Right, right. The uh, ace of Spader on yeah. Twitter. <laughs> but the, the teams are looking at, and many of the writers are looking at, an easier way now to judge players. Because what war is, is a ranking of players. Mm -hmm. And if you trust war, then you can say, okay, well, this guy was clearly among the best. And so I think at the end of the day, in terms of... And, uh, the, the Hall of Fame analytics will make the job of the voter easier. From the 636, what about Brendan Donovan? I was going to bring his name up, too. He's got a chance. You think so? Yeah, because I I think that he, what, is he 25, 26? I, I've got it right here. But he is a guy that could lead off for the Cardinals for a long time. He's shown himself to be a good defensive player. He's got to stay healthy. He's 27 years old. But he's a guy that if he has, we're, we're talking Matt Carpenter, right, as a possibility. Brendan Donovan could very easily be Matt Carpenter that plays better defense. And a bunch of doubles. Yep. I, I look at him as a doubles machine if he plays a full season. And that, that'll be the key. I mean, these guys need to stay on the field. Um, and it's just kind of a fun conversation. Prior to 30, and as you said, Brooke, we're talking about Jordan Walker. Now, I'm going to dive a little bit into the numbers here. At the age of 21, so last year, he had an OPS plus of 114. So you may be asking, what does that mean? And that's, the, by the way, the sixth best by a Cardinals rookie. OPS plus takes a player on base, slugging percentage, normalizes that number across the entire league. So it takes into account, like, external factors, the ballpark. In the final two months, he had 125. Mm -hmm. So that's 25 above the average. And the average is 100. 100. So he's just getting better and yeah. better, and he would seem to be the guy. It's It makes it so exciting to think about what all he's going to be able to accomplish. And with Brendan Donovan, I'm curious, because you are a part of the Red Ribbon Committee, mm -hmm. Randy, how much do you guys factor into the fans' decision and how how excited they are about a player a that's, lot that's why david freeze was on the ballot last year and i feel like brendan donovan is made himself he's he quickly yeah, a fan favorite yeah, he has a chance to be that guy he's got two years under his belt now but i think he'll need to have a, a longer amount of time and as we saw with freeze and i think freeze kind of changed the the approach a little bit because freeze did have a great month of october but if you take away that month of October in 2011, we probably don't even consider David Fritz. No, not a chance. Right? But, and it's for the fans. Yeah. You know, this is not Major League Baseball's Hall of Fame. This is the Cardinal Hall of Fame. And that's, I was disappointed that David didn't go in. I, I really thought he should have done it and accepted it. I know he doesn't want the attention and just kind of wants to live his life. And I get that. Uh, and I respect it. I just wish he would have gone in. To the point about the fans, you know, Carpenter, I was saying this a couple years ago when he was having awful times on the field is recency bias too yeah that's part of it is you know if he goes out and doesn't play well in the final two years you kind of forget what he did in 12 and 13 and 14 where he was one of the best hitters in the game taking the the emotion away from it is a real advantage because as we all love Matt Holiday, Matt Holiday is one of our favorite guys ever, but he didn't have a good last couple of years either. But you take the emotion away and then you look at it with a, a more objective eye. He was awesome. He was unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, he lived up to the $120 million he, he and did. then some. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I loved his Cardinals Hall of Fame speech, by the way. He was That fantastic. brought tears to my eye. Yeah. That was so, it was such a great speech. And that's one of the things, by the way, with Matt, where I look at it 
not only for what he did on the field, but what he did off the field. For sure. And I, I vote that way when I vote for the Hall of Fame, too. He did Homers for Health, which is still going today, and it's helped out so many families and kids through Cardinal Glennon, got other players involved. That's why Wayno, for me, just won't be a Cardinal Hall of Famer. just didn't do enough in the community. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. Whoa, wait a minute. Yeah, he's done so much. But also, too, things that Matt Holliday has continued to do for the Cardinals. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was the one that really helped recruit Nolan Arenado here to St. Louis. You guys remember that? Right, yeah. No and doubt. Matt Carpenter yeah. and yes. others that he has helped at his facility, yeah. which is second to none at, at Oklahoma State and Stillwater. So, uh, yeah, it, you know, he is the per- he ex- he's a perfect example of what a Cardinal Hall of Famer yeah. should be. He's not a Major League Hall of Famer, but, man, he's he's really good when he played for the St. Louis Cardinals. Absolutely. By the way, check out Wayno on X on Twitter. He's giving you St. Louis restaurant tips. He was in town last weekend, and every day he's got a, a restaurant tip or two for you from from his his town. This, this is his adopted town. He, yeah. He loves it. And I wonder, and we, we're going to get to Jay Delsing in a moment, but I'm wondering if... It's not really easy to travel from St. Simons Island, Georgia. <laughs> not that it's really easy to travel from St. Louis anymore either. But I wonder if during the summer where when he's going to games and going to MLB Network, if it'll be easier for him to be here and have the family here than in St. Simons Island, Florida. Hmm, I didn't think about that. How about private planes? Oh, he well, certainly yeah. could afford it. I would think that, yeah. He, <laughs> so maybe he's yeah. going to hop on a private plane here or there. That's not a bad idea either. That's Dan. That's Brooke. I'm Randy. Coming up, we're going to head down to Mexico. I hope Jay Delsing doesn't have AT&T. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's next on 101 ESPN. <laughs>
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The Blues last night with a big 4 0 win over the Islanders, which included a hat trick for Pavel Buchnevich and a three assist game for Robert Thomas. Robert Thomas, by the way, comes up later on the show at 9, p- 9 o'clock in the morning with Randy, Danny, and Brooke. Also, Coming up this weekend, it's a full slate of games for all of your teams. The Blues, of course, will face off against the Detroit Red Wings this weekend on a Saturday, 11 a.m. puck drop up in Detroit. You can catch that right here on 101 ESPN. 10 a.m. will be the pregame time. Also, everybody else is in action as well. The Cardinals in action in spring training against the Marlins and the Mets on Saturday. Also, Missouri Tigers back in action. Another Saturday morning game they face off against Arkansas and the Fighting Illini, number 12 in the nation. They face off against Iowa with a 115 game also on your Saturday afternoon slate. That is your Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your roads and shop 24 7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? Dan and Randy and Jay Delsing has made his way down to Mexico, and that's where he joins us this morning. And I know that there are no phone issues because he just talked to Matthew Rocchio. Good morning, Jay. How you doing? Hola. Doing well. Thank you. That's that's the extent of my Spanish. Nothing hola. wrong with that. That's uh, Hola to you as well. Uh, que, que pasa? <laughs> uh, okay. I got All a, good. I got a question about your career. Obviously, Tiger Woods had the famous Scotty Cameron putter, and I'm reading an article about it right now. Did you have a putter during your career, or did you switch around? Um, I switched very sporadically. I about three putters, but I do have a Scotty Cameron that um, I I won a couple of uh, my bigger events with that is kind of special to me, yeah. Jay, well, first off, before I get into some golf questions, I just want to ask, can you describe what it's like in Cabo right now for us weather-wise? It is a little warm here, but what is it like down there? uh, Right now, Brooke, I'm looking out. um, It looks like the sun's about to come up, and I'm looking out at the Sea of Cortez with two, three palm trees out my window and um, a little bit of beach and some chairs. And... um, yeah, it's kind of perfect. Ooh, <laughs> nice. Good to hear. Well, I also want to ask you about, of course, with Tiger Woods. He was dealing with back spasms, but when the hell did he had those? Oh, Randy. About a week about back. A week back. No, Jay, you don't have to answer <laughs> don't that. Don't encourage him, Jay. Jay. <laughs> Anyways, yes, I do. back issues. How about that? But ultimately, he withdrew from the Genesis Invitational due to the flu. Do you have any concerns about his ability to hit his goal of competing in one tournament a month? Yeah, I mean, I think the big word there, Brooke, is compete. I mean, I, I'm first. There's there's a lot to unpack, right? I mean, the first we saw him shoot a 72, which was fine, uh, extremely rusty because he was really really sloppy in areas that I wouldn't have expected him to be sloppy. His his short game, a lot of his pitches, his bunker game was awful. Things like that that he should be able to practice. You know what I mean? But there's concern about what's what's Tiger's ability to walk 72 holes going to look like, you know, and, and, and with some inclement weather with Hillier golf courses, things like that. And then compete book. Does it, you know, a 72 in the first round, a, a, a really nice round. But when we're talking about competing, I mean, we're talking about getting to what was, what, what did Hideki got the 17 under par? I mean, so I, I do have some concerns. I, um, I, I, I guess the bottom line is we really didn't get to see enough, and I was disappointed. Obviously, the flu is nothing to sneeze at. It I, actually, the flu actually cost just uh, Jordan Spieth his spot in the tournament as well because he had he ran out of the scores tent needing an emergency bathroom break, and he thought he had already checked the scorecard correctly, which he hadn't, and so he got disqualified. You know, you could say all you want about Earl Woods. You know, Jay, but one of the things he did with Tiger was that he made him dominate on every level. And I bring that up because Charlie, Tiger's son, was in a PGA Tour pre-qualifier and didn't do well. What, what did you think about having him play in something that is very important and very tough with the field that he had to face? Uh, yeah, great call, Danny. I, I was really, really interested to see what Charlie would look like when he started competing in some of these events that meant something and his dad wasn't right next to him. So he, 
he, I think as a freshman last year, he, he his score counted the final round. I think he shot a 74 or 75, and his score counted um, for his high school state championship team. But for him to go out and drop 86, I mean, he's he did make a 12 on a par four, and that is something that a, a 15-year-old is going to do that an 18-year-old is really, really unlikely to do, right? That's just, you just kind of have to play your way through that. But if you give him a par instead of a 12, he still winds up with 78 or 79 and still quite a ways back. I mean, the low score when Charlie got finished was was six under, so he's 22 strokes behind in one round. I mean, that's far from being able to compete, but I'm sure he wanted to try to throw himself out there and see what it was like. What I would love to know is what were the conversations like with dad when you got home hmm. yeah right and you yeah, have like what are you going to say i mean you know these guys are i i know that tiger is talking about talking about winning the charlie and things like that and when you're that far off i mean he's going to say well here's what you have to work on here's how, here's what we need to do to to right the ship or get us heading in the right direction but you know tiger was dominant when he was 15 years old. Heck, he was on Johnny Carson, I think, when he was three. So, I mean, Charlie looks really good, guys, but he's got a long way to go. Hey, Jay, I want to go back to Jordan Spieth. And I'm old school, but I've never been a pro golfer. But we have technology. We see every single shot that a golfer takes in video. We've got computers. We've got the TV knowing the score that a golfer had. What is the point of having a golfer sign a scorecard and then be disqualified for that scorecard being wrong? Because mistakes happen. And a mistake happened just there. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to be stay old school on this and, and say it's still the golfer's responsibility to make sure that what happened on a uh, with the, the scores are correct on each hole. I mean, it's if so here in this case right here, Randy. So the rule is this, guys: you come in off the golf course. There are three chairs that the players sit in. Sometimes it's a two ball, so there's only two chairs there. Your caddy comes in right behind you. On the other side of the table, there's there are two laptops: one facing you, one facing the PGA Tour official. And you're not allowed to leave that scoring area. Uh, or you're allowed to leave the scoring area, but once you do you're deemed that you're, you're finished with your scorecard. Jordan had a bathroom emergency. He certainly could have got some dispensation there. He could have said, guys, I know I need, and the tour would have said, you know, go to the restroom and then get right back here. They, they would have done that. But there were a couple of things that happened. Jordan had just made a double bogey on 18 and he was pissed. Okay. And he's got this going on. I, I really still mistakes still happen. I mean, what you just saw was, um, uh, a mistake that that you know they put a, a three on on his on his score for hole number four, which is a par three, and so he made bogey and they gave him a par and nobody caught it. I mean, they go through three different checklists of catching it, and it just it, sometimes it just sneaks through there. I it sounds stupid, but I mean it's such a small amount of responsibility. The player should still be. I, I think he should still be on the hook for it. Okay. And Spieth also held himself accountable on X, which I thought he did a really good job of. Jay, I want to go back to the Genesis Invitational because I have to ask you about the masterful final round of Hideki Matsuyama. What did you think of that? Especially he made six birdies on the back nine to storm it to that victory. Uh, just incredible, Brooke. And he goes through streaks like this. He's, he's won a couple of championships where he had, he's always been a really, really strong ball hitter when he I think I saw a stat when Hideki finishes in the top 10 in strokes gained putting, he wins. So it's really predicated on him making some putts. But, Brooke, to your point, I mean, on 15 and 16, which are really, really demanding holes with difficult hole locations, he hit two shots in there, one or two inches from the hole, back to back. So Hideki was, was absolutely on fire. And, you know, he's won a major. He's won nine events in his PGA tour career. And he's now the, the leading money winner from the Eastern part of the the world. I think he, uh, KJ Choi was the prior um, leading money winner of an Asian born player. But, and so, I mean, that's kind of a no brainer because of Hideki's age, but I thought it was fascinating when Hideki birdied 17, he was just over the green in two 
<clears throat> and there's an up close shot of his ball, and it looks like his ball is moving. When Hedeki, when Hedeki sets his wedge down behind his ball, it looks like his ball um, moves, and it and it's just rocking. It's, it didn't change its position, but sitting in the grass, and the weight of his wedge moved the grass a little bit, so the ball oscillated but didn't change positions. And Jim Nance, I thought, had a great – uh, a, a line where he said, "You got to go pick on somebody else." There's no, <laughs> you know, there, there's, there's no, there's no uh, foul here. I thought that was really, really good. And we have a tour official. I mean, guys, it's gotten so crazy, but we have a tour official monitoring every single camera shot that makes it onto TV. So, yeah, yeah the, there's another reason that there should never be someone disqualified for something like that. Jay, as we know, not a lot of changes at Augusta National. The Masters not far away. They put out their scorecard this past week. The only noticeable difference was adding 10 yards to the second hole, and people say, well, only 10 yards, but that really changes that hole, doesn't it? Danny, it does. They moved. They also, guys, they said they moved the tee back into the left a little more. So if you've seen this hole, it's going to be back into a shoot more. But the angle is more important than the 10 yards. So number two is a downhill sweeping to the left, dogleg left, par five. It's a hole that year, uh, years back, Louis Ustazen made a two on, on it, on only the second two in Masters history. So what it's going for the majority of the players on the PGA Tour, their preferred tee shot is for right hand, their majority of them are right in the golfers are, are fades something going left to right so this is going to make a tee shot much more demanding it's going to have to be hit more out to the right and and turned over to 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 get it hooking and missing that sand trap also notice guys that they invited they expended extended a special invitation to a live player yesterday and it was joaquin neiman and i think that's really interesting for augusta to do that i think it's well deserved and earned and, um, you know, so I don't know, you, there's still, you, you, you just never know what the hell's going to happen in the world of golf right now. Jay, last thing, yesterday on the Eli Manning podcast, he had John Rahm as a guest, and Eli was being self-deprecating, hoping John Rahm would answer Eli. When he asked John Rahm who the worst celebrity golfer he ever played with was, and Rahm said, oh, it's J.J. Watt, and it's not even close. The worst celebrity golfer Jay Delsing ever played with is... Oh, gosh, I didn't play with Julius Irving, but he was not good at all. That was really, dis- really super disappointed. I, his body was just not made for golf. I, his arms are too long and his hands were, were so big. I would have to say uh, Julius Irving. But I got to tell you guys, the Tom Brady tee shot off the first hole at Pebble Beach it had it made me smile. It really, really. <laughs> <laughs> and who do you and Danny have on the show on Sunday morning? We've got Jim Tejans. Um, so uh, J- Jim is a, uh, a former um, NASL North American Soccer League guy. He's a an Oakville um, guy as well, and he's had two heart transplants. I think he's had a, a liver transplant as well. He's a walking talking miracle and really a, a cool story and then we have a our, our uhy uh, prep profile series on so we interview a bunch of the uh, the best high school boys as the high school boys get ready for their golf season this year all right looking forward to that have a great trip thank you so much for the time we appreciate you getting up early for us and we'll talk to you soon how do i say goodbye in spanish Adios. 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 <laughs> Adios. Thank you, Jay. See you later. Uh, Jay Delsing on 101 ESPN. Coming up, we've got Take It or Leave It. Get your text into the Air Comfort Service text line 314-399-9646. 314-399-YOHO. A Friday, YOHO on 101 ESPN. <laughs>
say something, we put it out there. If you like it, you can take it. If you don't, send it right back. You get your text in to 314-399-9646. And give us your take it or leave it. Brought to you by Gloria Lou Realty. Visit GloriaHasTheBuyers.com and start packing. That's my final offer. Take it or leave it. Time for Teoli here on 101 ESPN. Brooke, Dan, Matthew, and Randy, great to have you with us. Text in your Teoli. Uh, let's start with this. Uh, Lee Dom in the Dominican Winter League has named Albert Pujols as their manager for 2024-2025. Take it or leave it, the next manager of the Cardinals is not Yadier Molina, it's Albert Pujols. Uh, does Yadi know that? Uh, that's why I'm giving you the take it or leave it. I might leave it just because I don't know. I think Yadi clearly wants to be the next manager of the Cardinals if it'll if that's allowed, if that's going to be a possibility that comes up for him. So I think it could be Yadi first, but I don't know. Pools also being a possibility is a tough one. Boy, Ollie doesn't like this conversation, does he? No, no. he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't. But you, you got two icons, right, that are uh, taking the reins of teams. And you, Ollie, are in the last year of your contract. So it's a natural conversation to have. I would leave it. And I would say, though, they come together as a combination. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe sooner than later, not necessarily the manager, but maybe a bench coach or a hitting coach. I, I can't imagine what it would be like to be getting advice from Albert Pujols, who's mm-hmm. one of the smartest hitters that's ever played the game. And he'd be great. I'd love to see him back with the Cardinals. I know in talking with Ollie that he had reached out to Albert about uh, and vice versa about trying to join the staff. It just didn't quite work out. And I don't know if it's the personal services contract or exactly how it all plays out. Um, but he wanted to be a, he wants to be a part of the Cardinals future going forward. So we'll see how it plays out. And we're going to discuss this more at eight because I feel like there's a lot more to dive into there. Mm-hmm. Well, take it or leave it, guys. The Diamondbacks have launched a D-backs TV so you can watch them all season long for ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents. Just go ahead and say it's one hundred dollars. But anyways, <laughs> um, so you can stream Diamondbacks games in the Arizona area with no blackouts. Take it or leave it. You would pay that for Cardinals TV. Yeah, I'll take it. 100 bucks for six months. Yeah. I think that's the direction we're going with most teams. Mm-hmm. So I, I think most fans, I'll take it. I think most fans will say, absolutely, I'll pay for that to get my games. And it should be easily available for all fans, including those in the market that you play in. So be a good thing for everybody in baseball. All right, take it or leave it. This past Sunday was the second lowest NBA All-Star game viewership on record. Last year was worse. The NBA lost 80% of its all-star viewership since the 1990s. It is time to say goodbye to NBA All-Star Weekend. Ooh. Yeah, I'll take that. Like, Players just need a break. It. What yeah. would you do? Maybe the thing to do, and they, they have their Young Stars competition on Friday night. Maybe the thing to do is just to have the Young Stars competition and let that be your all-star game. Maybe a celebrity yeah. game as well, which they do. Yeah, I like that idea. If you do that, I think that you could save it in that way. But I'm not surprised that the viewership is down, honestly. No, and BK and Ferrario were talking about it. BK mentioned that we've seen every dunk. It's The the, the dunk contest is so obsolete. Yes. The three-point competition, don't really need it. I, gl- I was glad they added the flair. With Sabrina Ionescu. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so that was cool. But in terms of the game itself, scoring 400 points in a basketball game, crazy. Yeah, it wasn't really a game. It was just a shooting contest. Should we just get rid of all All-Star games? I, I tell you this. is still good. I wouldn't want my pitcher on the mound, though. No. That, that's the guy that, I, you know, do I really want Garrett Cole blowing out his arm, uh, on you know, in an All-Star game? I don't. There's just so much money in the game. Why take the risk if it doesn't mean anything? Yeah. I used to like it when the in the baseball all-star game they would let a pitcher go four innings. Great, wasn't it? Yeah, those were the days. And wearing like white day. white spikes. Yeah. Remember they do that? That was kind of a special thing yep. for the all-star game. Non see through pants. Don't, exactly. <laughs> non see through <laughs> pants. Maybe you just don't do the game aspect for a lot of these and you just have more of this. I enjoy sometimes the skills competitions for some of them. Same thing with hockey, the hockey all-star game. Who's watching that? But I like the competitions beforehand. Mm-hmm. I remember uh, Jimmy Edmonds telling me that the home run derby actually messed up his swing. 
So wow. he was in the home run derby and trying to lift the ball, get it out of the ballpark, and then all of a sudden it was all for real. And he's like, man, yeah. this is this is not – he just was out of whack when he came back. Yeah, that's a good way, good reason to stay away from it. All right, Matthew is uh, laughing at the text line. What do you got for us, sir? Not a great batch. Uh, take it or leave it. After the Orioles, the Cardinals have the best core of players under 25 than any other team in Major League Baseball. Walker, Gorman, Wynn, Newt, et cetera. I don't know about that. I'm going to leave it because the quality of the Orioles' young players, because mm -hmm. they drafted so high. Mm -hmm. Cardinals weren't drafting high, and not to say that they're not good players, but, man, we're talking about superstars potentially with, and Jordan Walker could be that, maybe Mason Wynn, but we're talking right now some real big superstars with the Orioles. I agree. Well, where do you think that the Cardinals' young core then kind of lands on the list? I think it's you yet to be top determined. 10. You think so? Uh, just because uh, we, when you're starting with with Jordan Walker, it's pretty darn good. Mason Wynn, we all anticipate, really defensively should be great. Newpar's got to stay on the field, though. That would be my mm -hmm. concern with him. Back-to-back mm -hmm. -back years in which he hasn't played a bunch. So, yeah, it, it's it's yet to be determined for me. Take it or leave it. Just make the NHL All-Star game five goalies versus five goalies. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> I would hate that. I'm all, I'm all about old heads. I think I I, I think getting like a preview, like who cares? Does Steve Nash really care if he tweaks his ankle at this point? Get him out there, run a pick and roll with Kevin Garnett. They're both in damn good shape. I see him doing video podcasts. Like do like a, do like a celebrity game, but also do like an old heads game. Wouldn't you love to see Larry God, Bird? That oh yeah, magic one mm -hmm. more time. Just like have those guys come out and literally Isaiah just Thomas. don't make them run up and down. Just literally have them like stand in the corner yeah. and just like just pass it to them for open threes like throughout the game. Like they don't have to run up and down at all. Make it kind of gimmicky. Uh, yeah, like I would love that kind of stuff. It's it's so stale now. I'm with you guys. Uh, take it or leave it. All star game should happen halfway through the off season. I still think though the money is why you would not want to play. It's just the organization doesn't want the player to get hurt. The player yeah. doesn't want to get hurt. Right. And it doesn't matter what time of year you play it. Right. And the the players are on vacation. Uh, the, the, they don't want to. An NFL player is not going to come to an All Star game in. February or March. A Major League Baseball player is not going to come to an All-Star game in L.A. Or, or Miami in January. It's just not going to happen. No. Maybe you put it where they go vacation. I don't know. I'm trying to think of any way to just well, improve it. Players but... aren't even being paid when the season isn't going on. They, yeah. they, they don't have any interest in that. I don't think the players care. I think it's an honor to be selected, which they take is an honor but like at the nba all-star game this is supposed to be a money maker for television and they're trying to negotiate the rights deal and the players are meeting with potential sponsors too it's it's become a big money thing for right. both the league and the players yeah it's bad take it or leave it ryan miller was the worst trade deadline move the blues ever made Oh, uh, there's been some dandies. Uh, there have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's and been then, some dandies. See, the thing was, and not that it worked out long term, but the Ryan Miller move actually wound up being good because you weren't going to be able to keep Halak. You were able to get rid of the Chris Stewart contract, which the Blues at that point wanted to get rid of. And they knew that if Miller succeeded, they could re-sign him. Or if, they, if he didn't succeed, they had Jake Allen, and then they could use the Ryan Miller money to sign Paul Stastny. There was a lot of forethought that went into the Ryan Miller trade. So... While it didn't work for the Blues, what they lose? William Carrier, the first rounder that they traded to Buffalo, didn't wind up being anything. Halak and Stewart didn't wind up being anything. So I don't think that that was really that bad of a deal. How do you remember all that? <laughs> I, just, I was working the Blues at that time, and I have no idea. Oh, I, you're amazing, man. Well, that's a compliment, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate it. No problem. That. I don't know how you, Dan, you mentioned some dandies. What is another one that you can think of off the top of your oh, head? Oh, I don't know. Well, uh, how about trading your second line and Robert Dirk for Garth Butcher and yeah. Dan Quinn? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, you, you were number one in the league, number one in the league, and you made that deal. How about trading Rod Brindamore? for Murray Barron. That was uh, a tough one. Yeah, you're trying to scramble because you screwed up the Stevens thing, and Brindamore winds up being a borderline Hall of Famer. Is he a Hall of Famer? He might be a Hall of Famer. And you get Murray Barron back. Nothing against Murray Barron, but he wasn't going to be Scott Stevens. No, not at all. So th th there have been some... Solid player, but not yeah. what you had. Right. All those years where you were trying to scramble to... Well, the, the Shanahan years were fun, but they were wild. And having to make the deal where you uh, wound up giving up Brownie, Jeff Brown, who was your best all-around defenseman, so that you could keep Peter Nedved. You signed Peter Nedved, and you didn't even really have a place for him. I'm trying to think of, I mean, Keenan had to pull off a bunch of moves. 
At the trade deadline. Like 65 of them. <laughs> exactly. I, and I don't have one that comes to mind. I just know he did a bunch. Yeah, and most of his bad work was done during the offseason. A lot of Edmonton Oilers made their way to St. Louis. Yes, they did. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, is that it, Matthew? Thank you, sir. That is Matthew, and thanks for your texts. We do appreciate them. Coming up, Jim Bowden at The Athletic has Ali Marmol number two on his managerial hot seat ranking. Are you buying that? That's next on 101 ESPN. We are just a couple of weeks away from Arch Madness at Enterprise Center, the 30th anniversary of the Missouri Valley Conference Men's Basketball Tournament taking place here in St. Louis at Enterprise Center. And you can get tickets now by going to archmadness.com. The tournament takes place March 7th through 10th, and an automatic bid into the NCAA tournament is on the line. And right now, man, there's a battle atop the uh, Valley standings. You've got both Drake and Indiana State sitting there at 23-5 and five overall and 14-3 and three in the conference. But Bradley has had a fine year. They could win the tournament. SIU could win the tournament. And there are a lot of teams that could come out of nowhere to get that bid to the big dance. To get there and see Arch Madness, all you need to do is go to archmadness.com. And right now, you've got a great family fun pack for any of the sessions, four single-session tickets, four large sodas, four regular popcorns, all for 100 bucks, so that you can check out Arch Madness and take in one of the great events on the St. Louis sports calendar. It starts March 7th. Get your tickets today at archmadness.com.
the opening drive's fresh take. Your time check brought to you by Clarkson Jewelers, an officially licensed Rolex jeweler, Brooke Grimsley, Dan McLaughlin, Randy Carricker. Great to have you with us. Yesterday at the Athletic, Jim Bowden put out a piece with the managers, the five managers on the hottest of hot seats in Major League Baseball to start the season. Bowden listed number one, John Schneider of the Toronto Blue Jays, and number two, Ali Marmol of the St. Louis Cardinals. This morning at the Athletic, Jason Stark has a piece out and the headline asks the question, which MLB teams, front offices, and managers are feeling the most pressure insiders weigh in? And he paneled 31 executives, former executive coaches and scouts to determine which teams, front offices, and managers are feeling the most pressure. He's got the Yankees at number one, and at number two, he's got Ali Marmol and the Cardinals. They got 12 votes from the panel of 31, and Stark writes, the good news for the Cardinals, our voters have mostly good things to say about an offseason in which they added Sonny Gray, Lance Lynn, and Kyle Gibson to their rotation and added depth to their bullpen with Andrew Kittredge and Keenan Middleton. The bad news for the Cardinals, their entire rotation Rotation might be 33 or older, and we heard lots of concern about their manager, Ali Marmol, and his ability to navigate this vessel's storms. Quote, they'd be at the top of my list of teams most likely to make a change of manager, said a rival NL exec. I'd just say this, don't go to sleep on the job Yachty did managing Puerto Rico in the Caribbean series. That's what Jason Stark writes today at The Athletic. So if you're Ali Marmol and somebody is paying attention to the media for you, or if you're paying attention to the media, you have to see this stuff, and it's got to hurt. But at the same time, he's put the pressure on himself, too. He has every expectation of winning this season. He's not blind. He knows he's in the last year mm -hmm. of his contract, right? He does. He is. Yeah, it's a lame duck season for him. We discussed that. And Ali Marmal has also discussed that, too, that he's very, very well aware of what's at stake this season for him. Now, the question is, what would have to happen this season for that to even happen for them to part ways with him? I would say midway through the season, if you're five, ten games under 500, that would be a tough sell for Ali to stay. I, I also think the first month of the season is critical for the Cardinals. When you have the Dodgers for four, Mike Schilt is going to be fired up in San Diego. So that, that road trip is not easy to start the season. Then you have Miami, the Phillies, so two playoff teams. Arizona went to the World Series. You have Oakland, they're awful. You got Milwaukee, Arizona again, the Mets, and Detroit. I think it's imperative that they stay ab around 500 and settle in in that first month of the season. Let me say this. I know Ollie well and uh, had the chance to go to breakfast with him a few times and lunch a few times this offseason. He truly welcomes Yachty and Albert to be a part of this franchise in terms of coaching. He's like, I, I'm not looking over my shoulder. If these guys make us better, then I'm in. I'm all in. And that's not just him saying that. He truly believes that. I think the one thing you have to look at is these writers, when they talk about what happened last season, and I understand where they're coming from, but they ranked 24th out of 30 teams with a 4.79 ERA. So he was saddled with some tough pitching as guys got hurt along the way. And there's nothing really he can do about that. So guys need to stay healthy and make their starts. And by all accounts, Gray, Lynn, and Gibson, knock on wood, will do that for them. Jim Bowden also po pointed out a little bit later in the article, too, everything that we've discussed before about issues with the clubhouse as well. And that's something that I think that a lot of people maybe look at with Ali Marmal is it seemed like the clubhouse was a big issue. It doesn't even seem like it because we talked about everything that happened with Wilson, Wilson Contreras last season, even the whole Tyler O'Neill situation. And they added so much veteran leadership this past offseason that you do wonder why the clubhouse did get so out of hand. Well, I would look at um, not winning as being one of the reasons why you have a bad clubhouse. And if they were winning last year, I bet we don't hear anything about it. And when your top player is struggling, which is Nolan Arenado, and he's frustrated, things like that come out. I don't think Ali handled the O'Neill situation great, although I think there were some veterans in the, the clubhouse that thought that was long overdue to, to do that. Um, but I, I just think that first month is going to be telltale in many ways for how this thing goes. And I like the Cardinal moves for the inning eaters as well. 
Do I wish they would have gotten a, a legitimate front of the rotation guy? Yes, but that front of the rotation guy didn't get moved this offseason. <laughs> yeah. He just wasn't available to the Cardinals. But you brought up their overall ERA. They had one starter who had a 4.73 ERA last year in Gibson, and a, Lynn had a 5.73. So they need the staff that they have to make these guys better, too. They feel that Lynn... They they feel he can get on top of the baseball and get more sync. And I, I know that he had a, a tough year and gave up a bunch of home runs, but you don't sign these guys, to your point, Randy, unless you feel you can fix them. Mm -hmm. And they see something with these guys along with the innings, but they also see something that they feel that they can address, whether it's with analytics or the eye test, looking at film. They, they just, you know... It's got to come from this starting rotation to give them a chance to win. Not just the starting rotation, but the bullpen was a huge issue for the Cardinals mm -hmm. last season. Do you guys feel a little bit more secure with the bullpen going into this year? I do. I, I like the additions of Middleton and Kittredge. And you never knew what you, when he was with the Cardinals what you were going to get out of Hennis Cabrera. Uh, there were moments for Jordan Hicks, but they weren't all great moments. We all remember him throwing the ball over the first baseman's head to lose a game, right? Uh, Cabrera was not good last year. He's got to be better. And you need to have a healthy Ryan Helsley. If you're going to succeed yep. and you're the Cardinals, you need to have a healthy Ryan Helsley. Can I make one other quick point here about yes. these articles? Nobody mentions Mo. And, Dan, I think you agree with me. Mo and Ollie are kind of a package deal right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Uh, they are. And, and, Mo is is steadfast in his belief that Ali can get this going. And uh, the one thing that makes this tough, though, I think for Ali is when you have Yachty and Albert <laughs> saying, well, we want to manage someday. Man, that puts some heat on him. Mm -hmm. And you can understand where he's coming from saying he may not say it publicly, but there's some heat on him in that regard, too. Especially when Yachty won't show up in camp. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just don't understand that. Yeah, I I, was, I am pretty disappointed in that because I was hoping that he would show up. But I'm interested to see when he does show up, what that exactly will look like. And as you mentioned, Ollie has talked about that, that he has embraced welcoming in Yadier Molina and now Albert Pujols as well. But it seems like these two guys are not far away from wanting to be managers in Major League Baseball. Yadi, no. this would be his time. Spring mm -hmm. training, in my opinion, you, you've invested $87.5 million in Contreras. He struggled defensively. And if you're Yvonne Herrera, you've been around Yachty, but he hasn't been a coach. You know, he, they were teammates. So that's a different element as you look at how this goes forward. And, Dan, games start tomorrow. And just to lay it out there for you, not that teaching stops when games start. But the, the valuable time for Yadier Molina to be with the catchers was the last two weeks. It's not when games are being played. I agree. And I guess you can pick up some things. Well, of course you can when you're watching games. But I'd rather see him, and he will, get behind a plate when they're working on the side and, and try to catch the ball and frame it and be, be soft back there with soft hands. But you're right. These last two weeks would certainly help when you have those eyeballs on him directly and uh, you're maybe standing behind him or just to the side and just see some of the things up close that need to be addressed. Don't you kind of worry, though, with this day and age in baseball, the managerial role has changed so much that you worry about bringing in two of those greats to be a manager. One, we know that the pay is not what exactly you would expect it to be for a manager but then it comes in it almost seems like managers don't stick around as long as they did with like the tony russa days but well, you'd get immediate respect the yeah. minute that they walk in the clubhouse and it's yeah. not to say that ollie doesn't have it or some of the other coaches that either did not play in the major leagues or for a limited time but there's a different animal when those two guys show up yeah. and say i'm here to manage or i'm here to help and they can't get enough baseball clearly i mean there was no good reason for albert pools to come back here for that last year for two and a half million dollars except for the fact that he just wanted to play ball and, and yadi played as long as he did because he just wanted to play ball i i think those two are married to the game mm -hmm. i do too they love playing baseball or did and when you're out of it you're you, the the you put so much into 20 years of playing at, the, at this level, and it's rinse and repeat every single day. It's late nights. It's early mornings. You're playing a game. You've got meetings. And then all of a sudden, it stops. Yep. It, it comes to a screeching halt. And that's why you hear when players retire, they try to figure out that itch, that competitive itch. And it's hard. So if you have the resume of Albert or if you have the resume of Yachty, immediately doors are going to open and say, please help us out. Immediate respect, as you guys mentioned, by the players. And you have to deal with the likes of us, the media. So that's another True. different animal they have to face. Yep. I want 
Albert's team to be managed against Yachty's team. I want to oh. see who comes out on top. That would be fun. That Good. Yeah. That's the fresh take here on 101 ESPN. Joe Vitale next here on the opening drive. Have kids under 25? We can save you money at carltoninsurance.net. Welcome to Travers GMT Auto Sales West in St. Louis RV in O'Fallon, Missouri. Conveniently located at 70 and Bryan Road. RV show season is finally here. Say goodbye to parking costs, entry fees, and downtown traffic jams. Join us at the St. Louis RV Show from February 23rd to the 25th. Explore hundreds of new and pre-owned travel trailers, fifth wheels, and toy haulers. Featuring the top brands like Winnebago, Heartland, KZ, and more. And if you're in the market for a car, truck, or SUV, look no further than Travers GMT West right next door. Visit us today or check us out at stlrv.net or gmtautowest.com. ESPN has your chance to score. is The View from Vitaly, brought to you by Scott Lee Heating Company, a proud Mitsubishi Electric Elite Contractor. I'm going to take you behind the curtain here because Matthew Rocchio, when he called Jay Delsing this morning, made a mistake and called Joe Vitaly first. Brooke? Dan, Randy, and uh, Joe, I bet you were surprised when the phone rang this morning at 7.30, weren't you? Hey, you know, a little surprise. I was kind of doing, man, did I did I miss daylight savings time? What's <laughs> happening right now? Um, uh, luckily for Matthew, uh, I always enjoy his sparky intros to my Friday mornings. And, <laughs> and the other good news for him is that with five young kids, I've been up for two hours anyway. So we're good to go. 
This is good to hear. And I, I also need to know, this must have been, and for those that aren't aware, uh, Joey runs with some buddies every Friday morning. This must have been ideal running weather for you this morning. This this is as ideal, I think, as it gets. I mean, I mean, truly. I mean, no hat, no pants. I got to let the gams out now. No in oh, there, okay, there we go. Well, I, like well, I shouldn't say no. I mean, there's not there's something there. I mean, there's just not pants. Oh, okay. I mean, so, okay. So, so, gotcha. I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is I wear shorts. I, I got to get a little sun on the old gammers. You know what I mean? <laughs> got to get ready for beach. I got, got the beach coming this summer. Okay, I, I I understand. <laughs> Just don't wear the uh, baseball uniforms because those seem to show more than you'd like. You know what? Uh, yeah, baseball uniforms are not ideal for for hockey players in general. Uh, the, the, the pants has is, is, been an issue for a long time. Luckily, I found a great brand. Uh, Crosby actually led me on to them, a pair of jeans. That the only the only brand that he he's ever been able to use because. You go to a tailor or you go to a to a Nordstrom's. I mean, there, there are guys that look at you like I, I just have no idea what to do with what's going on down below your waistline. I just there's just there's so much tailoring involved. I, I I bought a pair of pants once. The tailoring was actually going to cost more than the actual pair of pants. That's how much work needed to be done on it. And uh, so yeah, one of the uh, as Jamal Mayers, uh, who I coach with, uh, once said, uh, you know, hockey legs, good for hockey, bad for life. You know, I think that's the, the, the true, that's on a t-shirt. It's a truest statement. I remember when, uh, I started dating my wife in, in, at Northeastern in college and she didn't tell me this till like months down the road, but she's like, I really had a rough time getting past this like lower section of you. Like I've never seen anything quite like it. <laughs> Before and I wish it was she was talking about something else. Unfortunately, she wasn't. But it was more of a, the the muscle, the muscle structure yeah. in the uh, in the lower body. It, it is something where when you skate for a living, uh, you can't help but prevent to uh, to have these these quads in the the rear end kind of getting gores at times. Okay, I got a couple of things. Number one. <laughs> Uh, when did, did, did this time did to you, move on to hockey did, after that, well, Randy? <laughs> couple of things. Yeah. We, we, we did this, we, we, at what point in your life did you notice that your lower half was changing? The, the, your legs and, and your, your butt. And, you, know, you were just becoming, uh, you were having a, a hockey lower torso. Were you like a, a teenager? When did you realize that this was happening to you? I'm glad that you you you, uh, you clarified that. I hate for someone just to be tuning in right when you asked the original question there. Um, <laughs> I, I would say it was probably it was probably high school college. You know, uh, I, I spent summers up in Minnesota, uh, basically just to get away uh, from St. Louis. My dad, uh, of course, uh, he ran a concrete company here, and he made us work in uh, poor concrete all summer long. So I tried to get, find an escape, and at that time there was one hockey school in the whole country, really, Minnesota hockey camp. So I would go up there. Uh, but to be honest, I think that the, I think that not only hockey, but, you know, shoveling concrete uh, certainly uh, is an incredible workout. And it certainly uh, helped me, I think, with hockey, uh, not only from a physical standpoint, uh, but definitely from, um, I would say, just a mental grind standpoint. You know, I, I still look back on uh, how I was very fortunate. I got I got very lucky in a lot of different areas of life to, to get to where I was, and I had great people around me. But, you know, parents a lot of times ask me, you know, at, at the hockey rinks and, you know, hey, how many how many shots did you take as a kid? And what, what were you doing in the summers? I mean, to make it to this level, I mean, you must have been just dialed in. And I just tell them, guys, listen, I, I, I poured concrete every summer from when I was like 10 years old all the way till I was 16. And I decided I just want to get out of here and not do this anymore. I was so tired of pouring concrete. And like, hold on a minute. You're telling me you poured con What did you do in the summers? Like, I didn't touch a puck. I didn't touch my hockey stick till August. And when school was out, my dad usually gave us a week off, me and my brothers. And then he had us pouring concrete in the field. And uh, you want to talk about... Uh, a grind and just trying to trying to get through the summer and, and working those long hours and being around those people and and the other great thing that concrete you know tells you and, and it teaches you very quickly in life and, and anyone in construction can appreciate this but concrete is a time sensitive material when it when you mix water with it and it gets laid down I mean you're on the clock and you got to get moving so it certainly taught me a lot of urgency you have to have urgency with concrete and of course 
uh, in the sport of hockey or in any sport for that matter. You have to have some form of urgency. So it taught me a lot as well. So I like to think it was uh, it was hockey, Randy, but also uh, shoveling concrete all summer long is definitely one of the workouts that, that will definitely help with uh, any kind of muscle structure you need for any kind of sport. Okay, one other quick one, and I know these two want to talk hockey. But and this is kind of hockey. <laughs> you get traded to Arizona to end your career. When you walked in and you had to don that Coyotes jersey for the first time, did you say – what the hell am I putting on here? That that logo and that jersey and the brown, I just can't abide it. So what did you think when you walked in and you said, I, I'm going to wear this? Did, is that I the was, way you said it? I was actually okay with it. You know, I actually liked those jerseys. You know, it was funny when, when I was a free agent that summer, uh, back in 14, uh, there was a there was a few teams, and it was funny. I, I had so many battles in the Eastern Conference with a couple of the teams interested. It was actually part of the decision where I just oh, I don't think I could ever be on that team. I mean, the New York Rangers was the the other team that you know uh, the contract and the term was relatively the same. But I just remember the the playoff battles the year before we had just lost in. Uh, uh, Marty St. Louis, I don't know if you remember that series, but his mom passed away in the middle of the series when the, us, the Penguins, we were up 3-1 to one in that series. And then the Rangers came storming back and won three straight and, of course, went to the cup final that year. So we had so many just battles like that. When the Rangers were calling me that summer, I was like, oh, man, I can't wear that jersey. I can't be a part of that organization. I'll never be able to look myself in the mirror ever again. Uh, so, I, you know, I thought Scottsdale was certainly – uh, on the Western Conference, I only saw them, you know, briefly. I felt like it was a good town to be a part of, and and obviously uh, the jersey, I kind of, I kind of liked it. And of course, Don Malone, uh, Don Maloney was the GM there at the time, and he was a huge fan, like Lou Lamarillo, who we saw last night. Uh, he was a big fan of low numbers. He didn't allow a lot of players to have low numbers. So I went from 46 in Pittsburgh, and then uh, I ended up adopting 14, which was actually my wife's college number. So she, I got her blessing. I was 14 in Coyote Red. We were going to see some sun. So, uh, truthfully, Randy, of all the jerseys I, I, I could have gone to, it was, it was a pretty easy transition for me. Okay, Joey, now we can get into last night game, a game because what a game it was for the Blues. There's a lot of guys that you could point to as being the best player on the ice. You could go with Jordan Bennington because he had the shutout. You could go with Buchnevich with a hat trick, Robert Thomas with three helpers, or maybe even Jordan Cairo. Who, in your opinion, was the best player on the ice last night? You know what's funny, Brooke? I, I actually think the best player was a player that wasn't even a star. And you just mentioned him, Jordan Cairo. You know, you got, of course, uh, Jordan Bennington gets a shutout, number one star. He was terrific. 38 saves, big saves, too. Uh, you look at the way the power play was being run by the Islanders in the first period, uh, multiple backdoor options that they did not connect on. You know, you look at Anders Lee to start the second period. The Islanders were coming out hot in the second. He gets a breakaway, stopped. Barzell, breakaway, stopped. I mean, this is all in a 0-0 game. So you can make the argument that Bennington was the best player on the ice. But I think that uh, with him being so good lately, it's kind of not what we're expecting. And I hate to say it that way because he was just that good. Uh, but that was your number one star. Pavel Buchnevich now with the empty netter, he gets the hat trick. That's certainly a reason to think that this is the best player on the ice. And the guy that with all the helpers and Robert Thomas. But I think that the guy that really drove – the entire night was Jordan Cairo. You look at Buchnevich's first two goals. They were set up directly because of the effort and the forechecking urgency of Jordan Cairo. I mean, especially the one right after the Brandon Saad power play goal to put the Blues up one nothing. They go right to the faceoff dot. They lose the faceoff. The Islanders are retreating their own end, and you just need number 25. He just puts on a burn and goes as fast as he can, strips the puck from Pollock, and then, of course, it's two passes in the back of the net right away. And then the same thing happens in the D zone. The way he jumps off the faceoff, he gets going. He, he creates that urgency to pump it up the ice. And then he makes an incredible C-cut move right to the middle of the ice after Robert Thomas gives it to him before he lays it off to Buchnevich. So, you know, you look at all the stars in the game. Uh, he didn't get the recognition. He did get a couple apples, again, or assists last night. But to me, uh, without number 25 and him driving the ship like he did, uh, maybe the Blues don't walk away with two points last night. And that's the that's the growing curve continuing for Jordan Cairo. This is what at times it could be frustrating when you don't see that style of the game from him as consistently as you like. And now you're not going to do it for 82. But can they figure out a way to get him doing that and playing that way four games out of six or five games out of eight? I mean, that that to me is where this kid has to get to on a more consistent basis because when he is there, like he was last night, I mean, it's electric and he can turn the game over. Joey, eight games out of nine on the road here. What, what realistically do you want to come out of this nine-game stretch with? 
I mean, listen, this is going to be a really tough stretch. You know, you got the Detroit Red Wings who won a big game versus the Colorado Avalanche last night in overtime. Uh, you're going on a Winnipeg Edmonton back to back with travel in Canada next week. That's going to be maybe the toughest back to back with travel the Blues have faced all year long before you end up coming home for one against the Minnesota Wild, who are hot. And then rain, they go up to the Eastern Conference, the Philly, the Boston, the New York Rangers. Yeah, I mean, it, it just gets really, really tough heading into this trade deadline. I think this is going to be clearly the most important stretch for them. You look at these next nine games, can they figure out a way, you know, possibly to go six and three? Can they put themselves in a wonderful spot? Can they put themselves in a position where maybe you add a piece or two at the deadline to make you a little bit better, you know, to get into the playoffs and maybe grab a first or a second round. One thing is unmistakable. I think you've talked to a lot of scouts and I've talked to a lot of them around the league over the last two weeks, especially and the thing about the Blues that really stand out about different teams, and you look at all the teams that are on that fringe, even the teams that are in a good playoff spot, what makes them different is that they have just the most exceptional goaltending, I think, in the National Hockey League right now, not only with Bennington, but with Joel Hofer, and they're sharing the load, which is incredible. So I think they do have a gift. I think they have to use that gift. That is the foundation of a good hockey team is making sure you're getting that save. They are getting that save. They're playing terrific right now. So if they can continue to play pretty well defensively, be fortunate and be opportunistic on power plays, start getting chips in on the next nine games, and maybe walk away out of here, you know, six and three. Is it crazy to think you could be seven and two? But even if you're even if you're, you know, five, you know, three and one or something like that, if you're still putting points together in a productive way, uh, because you've already made up a lot of ground around that all star break with piling up those wins like you did. I think you're going to definitely give yourself a great opportunity around the deadline to potentially add a piece or two and then make a nice little run at this thing. Joey V, you're the best. Thanks so much for the time. Enjoy your trip to Detroit. By the way, 10 a.m. St. Louis time pregame tomorrow and 11 o'clock faceoff. Have fun in Detroit, and we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good, you three. You guys have a wonderful weekend. See you later. Joe Vitale with us on 101 ESPN. Coming up, we've got the fight. We need a fighter. Text in. The text line is open, 399-9646-3314-399. Yo-ho! Yo -ho. Your name and the word fight, maybe you'll fight me next on 101 ESPN. Hey everyone, it's Brooke here and I want to tell you why I love the Missouri Athletic Club so much is because they're helping me stick to my 2024 goals that I set for myself this year. One, getting into better shape and also getting back into tennis, a sport I've played my entire life and right now I am crushing both of my goals because of them. I'm actually going over there this afternoon to work out with Christine. She's my personal trainer right now. I'm seeing her twice a week and she has really pushed me in my workouts and also I've gotten back into tennis thanks to Scott. He has really also pushed me on the court it's actually been a tough challenge for me but it just feels great getting back out there they always provide a wonderful experience and that's why i love my mac
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling. The Blues last night with a big win over the Islanders, 4 to nothing, including a hat trick by Pavel Buchnevich. Also, a three assist game from Robert Thomas. Robert Thomas will join the show coming up at 9 a.m. here on the opening drive. Blues, by the way, will be back in action on Saturday, facing off against the Detroit Red Wings. Catch the game right here on 101 ESPN with a pregame starting early at 10 a.m. before that 11 a.m. puck drop. Also, coming up on Saturday, St. Louis City SC is back in action this time. They are opening up their regular season MLS schedule as they host Real Salt Lake at City Park at 7.30 p.m. on Saturday evening. That is your Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling, an independent American standard heating and air conditioning dealer. Opening drive, Brooke, Randy, and Dan here, and it is now time for the fight. And our fighter today is Jeff. Jeff, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. You ready to face Randy? Is this your first time facing Randy? I guess I should ask. It is. It is. Oh. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a fight virgin. There you go. <laughs> well, best of luck today, Jeff. You ready for question number one? I am, thanks. Okay, who did the Cardinals acquire Royce Clayton from in the 1995 offseason? Was it the Boston Red Sox, the San Francisco Giants, or the Chicago White Sox? Um, The Red Sox, please. When the Kansas City Royals were started in 1969, which other franchise also entered the AL that season? The Houston Astros, the Washington Senators, or the Seattle Pilots? Uh, Let's go with the Seattle Pilots. Bobby Bonilla is most well known for his deferred contract payments and by Cardinals fans for a a short final season. But with which team did he win a World Series? Was it the Atlanta Braves, the Minnesota Twins, or the Florida Marlins? Uh, The Marlins. And question four, despite being over 70, Pete Carroll and Bill Belichick barely cracked the top five oldest NFL coaches. Which head coach set the record as the oldest ever at 73 years old? Was it Romeo Cronell, Bill Cower, or Marty Schottenheimer? Let's go with Marty Schottenheimer. Okay, final answer. Rock is going to take off his headset, go outside, and uh, go get Randy. So, Jeff, how do you feel here on the fight? How'd you do? Uh, to quote John Mozilek, uh, not great. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never know Fridays. Randy, well, just kidding. Randy's always sharp every single day. Every He's shaking day. his head, Randy yes, saying, not every day. <laughs> and he had his grapes today, so that's always yes. a sign that okay. Mega Mind is fully on. I've decided that I like uh, red grapes better than uh, green grapes. I do, too. Yeah. They're, they're sweeter. Yeah, I, they I like the sour of the green sometimes. I do, too, but these are really good. Have you had, have you had the cotton man. candy grapes? Yeah, the, but they taste like cotton candy. They're good. Yeah. Though. And that's a problem? Uh, for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Randy, say hi to Jeff. Jeff, good morning. How are you doing? Good morning, Randy. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for listening. Thanks for playing. Great to have you with us. All right, ready for question number one, Randy? Yes, ma'am. Who did the Cardinals acquire Royce Clayton from in the 1995 offseason? Uh, that would have been the 1995 offseason, I believe, the San Francisco Giants that Royce would have uh, come from, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Question two, Randy, ready? Yes. All right. When the Kansas City Royals were started in 1969, which other franchise also entered the AL that season? 69. Um, let's see here. It was not the Rays. Uh, <laughs> the Angels were 1960. So 1969 American League. Um, well, it was the Tigers, Tribe, Twins, no. Because um, they were before that. Uh, White Sox were before that. Uh, Angels, A's, Mariners were 77. Rangers. 
Final answer? Yeah, I'll go with the. I will go with the Rangers as my final answer. Okay. Now the, the, that was they moved, so were, they were not a new franchise. I don't believe so. So this is a new. Is it an expansion franchise or just a? Oh, okay. Uh, this should, let me read the question, but okay. expansion. Yeah. When the Kansas City Royals was started in 1969, yes. which other franchise also entered the AL that season? Entered the AL. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, 1969. I, I guess I'll go with them. That's the only logical choice to make. Uh, so I, I will go with, uh, the, uh, the Tejas Rangers. Bobby Bonilla is most well known for his deferred contract payments and by Cardinal fans for a short final season. But with which team did he win a world series? He won a series with the Miami Marlins, I believe in 1990, uh, Seven. The Edgar Renteria scheme winning hit. Yeah. Despite being over 70, hmm. Pete Carroll and Bill Belichick barely cracked the top five oldest NFL coaches. Which head coach set the record as the oldest ever at 73 years old? Wow, I'm surprised. 73. I'm going to go with George Hallis here. Could go with Burt Bell, but I'm going to go with George Hallis. Okay, final answer. Final answer, George Hallis. All right. I'm going to run out of tiebreakers at some point. We have another tiebreaker today here on the fight. A 2-2 tiebreaker between Jeff and Randy Carricker. So let's go through the rules here on the fight. I'm going to read off the question. We're going to give Randy Carricker a chance to write down his answer. We will then have Jeff give his answer audibly. Randy Carricker will then say his answer, and he can even show the lovely Air Alliance team cameras. And then whoever's closest to the pin is the winner on today's fight. Jeff, do you understand those rules? I do, thank you. Randy, do you understand those rules? I understand the rules, yes. I saw your paper. Do you have a pen? Linda Wood paper, uh, Sharpie, yes. Okay, I like how yeah, I can hear the Sharpie when you write. It makes it... It's, it's a, Scratchy. Yeah, yeah, I like it. It's, it's a good, it's a, it's a good, it's a good nat, nat sound, good, good pop. Uh, all right, here we go. For a win in the fight, what is the single season record for power play goals in a single NHL season? This is by a single player. What is the single season record for power play goals in a single NHL season? Okay. This one's simple. All right, Randy Carricker has given us his guess. Jeff, what is your guess, sir? Uh, I'm going to go with uh, my favorite number from the Cardinals, 23. All right. Just got to do a little bit of math here, and we have a winner. Oh, Randy, sorry. Uh, you can say, say your guess, please. I said 38. There we go. He, show, he only show, had 29. He was there. showing the Air Alliance team cameras. So do we have a winner in today's fight? Ring that bell. The winner and still champion of the fight, Randy Carricker. The fight is driven by CarShield. Plans to fit any budget. Visit carshield.com today. I'm sorry, Jeff. The NHL record for a single season is 34 goals. Randy Carricker just four off on that one. Like he said, Brett Hall, one of uh, many players who's just on that 30-goal cusp of power play goals in a single season. So Randy Carricker wins the fight today after a 2-2 tie. Well done, Jeff. I know I was in trouble with the hockey tiebreaker. Yeah, the, 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 the hockey tiebreaker is a rare one, but every once in a while i, I got to pull it out and fool some people. Let's go to the questions and answers here. The Cardinals acquired Royce Clayton from the San Francisco Giants in the 1995 offseason, and it was all just roses from there. <laughs> when the KC Royals were started in 1969, it was the Seattle Pilots who then oh. very, very quickly were moved to one Milwaukee year. For after just one year in Seattle. <laughs> they were the other team that joined as an expansion franchise in 69. There were also two NL teams as well. Bobby Bonilla, most well-known for his deferred contract payment, in by the Cardinals for a short final season, but it was in fact the Florida Mar or the Miami Marlins at the time of 1997 that won the World Series, and he was on that team. And despite being over 70, Pete Carroll and Bill Belichick barely cracked the top five oldest coaches in NFL history. George Hallis had that record for 50 years until Romeo Cornell was made interim oh, head coach of the one. Houston yeah. Texans in 2020 at 73 years old. He is the only coach to ever crack the 73-year mark. Romeo Cornell holds that record, and then again, the highest single season record for power play goals in a season is 34 so a win for randy character in the fight today jeff thank you so much for joining the fight and joining the show that's fun thanks a lot guys thanks we appreciate it and we appreciate you tuning in coming up we've got a quick rush hour reset for you before robert thomas at the top of the hour here on 101 espn
Gutterpros.com does more than just gutters. They do siding and soffit and fascia. They started out with gutters, but now they've added to their repertoire, and they do fantastic work on everything they do. As a matter of fact, they have an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau. They get 4.9 out of 5 stars on their reviews, and they're great experts at gutters. They do seamless 5-inch residential, 6-inch commercial, even seamless 7-inch commercial and industrial gutters, and they have the capability of, a, if you have a big building, of doing 8, 9, and 10-inch gutters if you need them because they do gutters better than anybody. And they'll do leaf protection for any kind of gutters that you have. If you have a lot of trees around and you have a gutter uh, problem that gets leaves in it, they'll take care of it. They cover an area about 50 miles around their downtown office. They're from St. Louis. They care about St. Louis. They're going to give you a fantastic free estimate and no pressure. They're a great company to work with. You will love them as much as I do. Set up your appointment today if you need new gutters at gutterpros.com. After all, they water goes where they tell it to go. Shen to the far side. They in the middle. They shoot. Score! Wide open was Brandon Saad. Power play goal. Blues have a one nothing lead. 2-0. They score! They come right in off the next draw and find Pavel Butch. Name it in the middle. Thomas with a head of steam gets it over the line. Hits the trailer. Kairu to the far wing. They score! Butch Name it. Two in a hurry. And the St. Louis Blues have made Chris Kerber, the call last night as the Blues scored a team record three goals in 32 seconds, and Pavel Buchnevich scored one more. The Blues win the game by a score of 4-0. A great job by Jordan Bennington, his third shutout of the year, turning aside 38 Islanders shots, and the Blues will head out on the road with a win under their belt. They play at Detroit tomorrow, 10 o'clock pregame, 11 o'clock faceoff here on 101 ESPN, but a good win for the Blues who are still sitting in that second wild card spot in the Western Conference. What a game it was. And I was very, very lucky to be able to attend it last night. Not saying I'm a good luck charm, guys, yeah, but you are. possibly if somebody wants to give me their season tickets for the rest of the season for the Blues home games, I will gladly accept to help in case that I am the good luck charm. Mm -hmm. But um, Pablo Buchanavich with the hat trick, and then you have Jordan Bennington just continuing to do fantastic Jordan Bennington things. I mean, 38 saves for him for the shutout, his third of his or of the season, I almost said career, excuse me, of the season because Jordan Bennington has done so much for the Blues this year. I, it's hard to pick out who was the best guy on the ice. I did think it was interesting when I asked Joey that question that he said it was Jordan Cairo, mm -hmm. who I think does deserve a lot of credit for what he did last night. I think a lot of fans look at last night and go, well, Pavel Buchnevich, his stock is on the rise. It doesn't hurt as the trade deadline is coming on March 8th. By the way, 15th career shutout for Jordan Bennington mm -hmm. with the 38 saves. We haven't talked about this yet. One of the great 
traditions in hockey is when that rookie makes his first ever uh, NHL start and they do the solo lap. Mm -hmm. I love seeing that. Bull Duke did it last night. It's one of my favorite things with a handshake after a series, too. Just kind of cool. Yeah, it, I, I love seeing it. And it, it's just cool for those youngsters to be the center of attention, yeah. at least yeah. for a while. I think it's very nice. I think that just to have that little moment where they're able to just really take it all in. I'd be curious when we talk to Robert Thomas here in a minute, what that experience was like for him, because I'm sure it's just a lot. You're already nervous going into the game, but then you have that lap. But I'm sure looking back, you really reflect on it and see how special it is that you were able to have that moment. Does one game elevate Buchnevich and his stock? It's only one game, had not been playing well up to that point. Do you think one game can make that much of a difference? They've got eight of nine on the road. Obviously, March 8th, as I mentioned, is the deadline. But uh, as I said, it doesn't hurt. Here's the thing. You had a bunch of scouts in the stands, and they're focusing on one game. The closer you get to the deadline, the bigger one game can be. Yeah. I, here's the thing is that personally, I think it does rise his stock. But I would hate to see him move. I would. I just think that maybe I'm kind of like Mo on Ollie. I'm a little bullish on Bushnevich. Mm -hmm. I like the way that he plays. I know that it hadn't been great here recently other than last night and what he's able to do. But it's because of last night you see what Bushnevich is capable of doing. And he's a player that I would like to have around, especially if they're making a playoff push here. Yeah, it's kind right. of, go ahead. Well, eight of nine on the road. What do you think is the next nine games? What do the Blues have to do? And uh, I thought Joey's optimism was great. He said six and three, seven and two. For me, out of the 18 points, if the Blues get nine of the next 18 points, I'll take my chances going down the stretch. I would too. That's where I was going, the exact mm -hmm. numbers. Yeah. And the Cardinals will start their spring training season tomorrow. They've got a home split squad game against the Marlins and a road split squad game against the Mets. Zach Thompson will start one of the games. Matthew Libertor will start the other. And the Cardinals will set themselves on the road to the 2024 campaign, which starts later in March against the Dodgers at Dodger Stadium. Looking forward to it. We mentioned that first month, a gauntlet for the Cardinals, including the first four of the season against Yamamoto, Glasnow, the loaded Dodger lineup. There's some pressure on the Dodgers, too, to come out of the gate and play well. Now, if they would go 0-4, would I anticipate them winning 100-plus games? Yes. But there's uh, that first series is going to be fun for both teams. Well, and that's why Mookie Betts said that every time a team plays them, it's going to be their World Series. Do you guys buy into that? Because, Absolutely. I mean, it, it is. The talent that you just listed there, the Dodgers are just going to be ridiculous this season. But we've seen before, that doesn't always matter sometimes during the regular season. They are great. They're, they're exceptionally talented. But on opening day against Sonny Gray, they're probably going to have Jason Hayward in the outfield. Outman will be one of their outfielders. I guess Chris Taylor will still be out there. I, I wonder what their outfield production is going to look like. Their infield production is going to be awesome. It's going to be unbelievable. <laughs> DH yeah. uh, production is going to be pretty darn good, too. Yeah. The, yeah. Mr. <laughs> Otani. Yeah, it should be fun. Looking forward to it. And there you have it. That's your Rush Hour Reset here on 101 ESPN. Coming up, as the Blues head out on the road today, heading to Detroit for a morning game tomorrow, we're going to talk to Robert Thomas next on 101 ESPN.
for Blues forward Robert Thomas on the opening drive. Driven by Pure Performance, the only stop for all your aftermarket vehicle needs. One, two, three, four. Rick Grimsley, Dan McLaughlin, Randy Carricker, and last night, Robert Thomas had three assists in the Blues 4-0 win over the Islanders, and uh, Robert joins us now here on 101 ESPN. Good morning, sir. How you doing? Doing well, guys. Thanks. Good to have you with us, and uh, it's got to feel good to close out the homestand on that that note with a four nothing win. Yeah, yeah, it's always nice. Uh, you know, we had a big stretch of road games coming up. I think it's like eight eight of ten or something like that. So um, you always want to end off those those home stands on a high and and get ready for the road. Well, Robert, a lot of special moments last night, but especially with Pavel Buchnevich getting the hat trick. What was it like dishing to Buchnevich last night? Yeah, it was nice. Um, you know, and I think I think Kyrie deserves a lot of credit on both those goals. He 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 really set them up and, and made the plays happen. And uh, yeah, it's always nice seeing uh, someone on your line get rewarded. Robert, when uh, the referee comes out and says to the fans, "Well, you're not going to like this," and then gives the call, uh, what was the reaction? Well, first of all, what was your reaction? What was the reaction on the bench? Is that what he said? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we we couldn't hear that on the ice, so I I have no idea. I didn't know he said that. Obviously, that's it awesome. made a lasting impression with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever had that though, where a referee says something kind of off the cuff and it's not the norm? No, I, I don't mind it at all. I think um, like people are starting to show more personality, and I think it's good for the game. And um, yeah, I, I had no idea he said that, but uh, I don't I don't mind it at all. So you didn't hear him say that. What what was your reaction then? What did you think was happening? Uh, I just wait for him to either point or wave his arms. So <laughs> that's pretty much all, all I see. Um, you usually can tell by the, the crowd usually reacts before he does anything. So that's usually what, what gives it away. What did you see out of Jordan Bennington last night? He got the shutout. You play against him all the time in practice. Just what did you see from your perspective? Yeah, he was uh, he was lights out. And um, you know what? That's, that's better for us. And that's what we need to, to have success. Um, he needs to be on top of his game and making big saves and big moments. Um, you look at you know, the, the power play early for them. Um, they had a couple of really good looks, and, and he came up strong and, and kept the momentum in our favor. And ultimately, that's what, what really changed the game. Robert Thomas with us on 101 ESPN. You mentioned eight of nine on the road. And w- w- with your really good teams, it didn't matter with the, w- when the Blues, where the Blues were playing. With this group, does it matter, do you think? Or do you, if you play your game, are you going to beat pretty much anybody you play? Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's our mindset of, you know, we play, play the game that, you know, we've played the last 20, 30 games. And uh, we, we might not win every night, but we'll, we'll give ourselves a damn good chance. And, um, you know, that's our mindset. And especially coming in, we got some big games on the road here. And, um, you know, we got to have that same mindset and, and put forth a good effort. Going back to the game for you guys last night, I mean, three goals in 32 seconds, a franchise record. What did you just feel like in the moment? And did you guys realize it was a franchise record? No, I, I had no idea, but um, pretty cool. Um, obviously, I think that's going to be a really tough one to beat. Uh, I don't know how you score much quicker than that, um, but it was it was pretty cool to be a part of, and um, yeah, I don't think I've ever been a part of something like that, so uh, it, was, it was a pretty cool experience. Well, for fans, they follow the trade deadline, um, and it's not that far away. It's March 8th. Do players follow it? Do you guys talk about it at all? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I've been a part of a couple now, and Obviously, the last one was was selling, so um, you know it's a lot more fun buying than selling. Um, but yes, yeah, players players kind of pay attention. You kind of get a feeling on on what's going to happen, and um, you can really tell. Um, you know, we got some road trips coming up, so if guys are packing big suitcases, uh, you kind of get a feeling. Oh hmm. yeah, that, hmm. that's is it un- tough. Yeah, is it uncomfortable at all, or is it? Uh, well, this is business as usual. Uh, yeah, it's it sucks, um, but you know it's part of the business, and um, everyone understands that. But um, yeah, it's it's definitely the the not so fun part of hockey. Hey, Robert, after the three assists last night, I don't know if you pay attention to this, but I do. You're on a pace for 95 points. How much, how much would it mean for you to be a hundred point guy in the NHL? 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely something I want to accomplish in my career one time. And, um, you know, it might not be this year. It might be, you know, a couple of years down the line. But, um, yeah, I think just just trying to get his – uh, just trying to help the team win, to be honest. Like we 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 need some wins coming down the stretch. We got some big road trips coming up, and um, yeah, that's really my my main focus right now. And you're working really hard. And, and points are it's not easy to be on a 95 point pace. Wayne Gretzky once had 215 points in a season. <laughs> How outrageous is that? Yeah, um, I mean, it makes us all look silly. You look at you know some of the records he had and. Um, the numbers he put up in his career. Um, I think more and more people are starting to finally realize just how good he was and, um, you know, across all sports uh, in terms of being the best. So uh, it's it's pretty cool. And, um, yeah, his numbers are, are pretty crazy. Here's my favorite Gretzky stat. He's got more goals than anybody in the history of the league. If you took away all of his goals, he'd still have more points than anybody in the history of the league. Yeah, uh, it's going to be a tough one for someone to beat. Uh, <laughs> no sure. doubt. And he hangs around St. Louis a lot, too. Have you been able to talk to him much? Yeah, um, I usually st- you, you run into him uh, around St. Louis quite a bit. So um, I know he loves us here. And, um, yeah, it's always cool to just chat with him. So do you, uh, when you do that, do you, what, what's the conversations like? Is it hockey or is it stuff off the ice? Uh, yeah, it's usually not not too much hockey going on. Um, he actually watches a ton of hockey, probably more than most people would think. And um, you know, sometimes he throws out a little piece of advice, and um, that's always the the coolest thing. I wanted to ask you too about Zachary Bolduc and his NHL debut last night. What did you see from him? Yeah, it's a it's an exciting time. Um, you know, your first game's always hard. You got nerves and excitement, and you don't really know what to expect. And uh, you're just kind of on cloud nine throughout the game. And um, so I, I think, you know, there's not too much to expect. Um, obviously, everyone knows his skill set and, and what he can do on the ice with the puck and, um, you know, his offensive threat. So um, I think just for him, it's just an enjoy the moment. Um and just try and have as much fun as possible. We were discussing this earlier, the rookie lap. What was that experience like for you? Yeah, I think me and Kyra went out at the same time, so it was kind of fun. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was probably nerve-wracking. I remember, you know, you go out without the helmet on, and uh, it feels weird, and um, everything's just kind of coming at you at once. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool cool experience. Do uh, the veterans pull him aside, or does anybody pull him aside just to try to calm his nerves? Um, no, you, you want him to just enjoy the moment the best he can. Um, you only get one first game, and um, I still remember mine. And you, you don't want to calm down. You just want to enjoy the, the whole thing. Okay, Robert, uh, Jeremy Rutherford told us yesterday that he visited with your family. He's got a piece coming out in The Athletic about hanging out with the the uh, Thomas family. Well, I've got to start with this. Uh, was J.R. Cordial, was he a great guest? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea, to be honest. Um, I, I heard it was... It was really awesome, and my family said they loved doing it. So, okay. um, so that means he was. That's about all I got. Good. Okay. Uh, second thing, how great are your mom's cookies? Uh, yeah, those are those are really good. Um, you know, it's every Christmas she'd bake them for you know all our family friends and stuff, and um, that was a that was a huge hit around the holidays. So, um, I, every time she comes down, she puts them in the freezer for me, and uh, it's pretty cool. And I know the teammates love them too, right? She makes them for the teammates now and then? Yeah, every once in a while in Toronto, um, she'll make them or or Detroit if she makes it down. So um, that part's pretty cool. And then uh, finally, JR said your dad gave him the choice of four different entrees for dinner. uh, And he didn't go with the chicken parm. I don't remember what JR went with. But the question is for you. Your dad says, okay, Robert, I'm going to make you one thing you get to choose. What is it that your dad makes great that you're going to take? That's that's tough. Um, he's a he's a pretty good chef, so um, I've always been a big fan of steak. So um, I'd go with go with the steak. He usually gets some pretty good cuts, and um, you know he's gotten pretty good over the years at at making sure it's it's better than restaurant quality. Cool. And by the way, uh, uh, Keith Kachuk, Big Walt, told Jr. to stay away from the cookies. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, everyone's all over the cookies, always. <laughs> hey, it's always great to talk to you, Robert. Have a great trip and a great stretch here with eight on a nine on the road. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks so much for the time, and congratulations on the win last night. Yep, thank you. See you later. Robert Thomas with us on 101 ESPN. Robert, is he's consistent in being a state guy. That was one of the most entertaining games of the season last night. Would great. you agree? I, I mean, with, because with of the you. goals, you were there. Yeah. I mean, what was the atmosphere like? It was really exciting, if I'm being honest. Maybe I'm just being biased because I was there, but I, I felt like that was the best game of the season. And because we're in a playoff push, it'd be different if the, it was like last year and they were, what, 12, 15 points out of a playoff spot. But it means something now, and it's really cool to have the Blues playing well in games that mean something. Yeah, I think going into the season, not many fans, well, some fans, felt like after Doug Armstrong's comments about where he said they would finish, it was kind of, eh. But now, with the way that they're playing, it, it gives you an interest level going into the trade deadline, and this will be the toughest stretch of the season, I would say. I've said that like four other times looking at the schedule, but this is it. This is it. This this truly is it because of all the games on the road. I like what, uh, well, not like, but it kind of, you know, gives you a little bit more insight into what the players are feeling where he's talking about some guys are packing a little bit of bigger bags than others mm -hmm. because that just shows the business side of it. Jeremy Rutherford had a great story, has great stories, but had one on Oscar Sunquist where he talked specifically about when he was traded from the Blues and it happened on the plane and how some of the teammates didn't even believe it was happening. It just kind of shows how this all works out sometimes. When uh, the Cardinals traded for Tony Pena back in 1986, they traded Andy Van Slyke to Pittsburgh, and it was April Fool's Day, and Slick thought it was a joke. He thought it was an April Fool's yep. joke when they brought him in and said, yeah, we just traded you to Pittsburgh. Ouch. <laughs> it's a tough one. 314 yeah. is asking about Wayne Gretzky really being in St. Louis a lot. He is. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's all around town. He'll, he'll go to Cardinal games. He's at uh, Blues games all the time, but you'll see him around town, restaurants too. His mother-in-law, I believe, is 102, and so he and Janet are here to help take care of uh, Wayne's mother-in-law, but they've, they've had the house here. As a matter of fact, when Brodeur was here, he lived in the Gretzky house. Somebody else lived in the Gretzky house for a while when they were here. And then when Wayne would come in, somebody would have to move into a hotel. But, yeah, he's, uh, he's here a lot. He loves the uh, Schnooks rotisserie chicken. Is that right? Oh, yeah. okay. That person's just, just admitting they've never been caught in line at the uh, front neck Starbucks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really? He's, he's you'll see him, you'll oh, see him like no. once every yeah. like two months. Yeah. Yeah. Now no, we've exposed that. It's Supposedly, easy. Pino is one of his favorite yeah. restaurants. Mm. I love Pino, by the way, if you guys haven't been there before. Great have you ever Italian seen him food. there? I have somehow I've missed him. I, of course, I saw him a lot during the Stanley Cup run. Mm -hmm. And by the way, he just seems like the nicest and most approachable person. I love how nice and encouraging it, he is, especially to young players in hockey. We've talked about it before about who is the face of the NHL. Wayne Gretzky still is because of the way that he just continues to stay around the game and talk about these young players. It is unbelievable that the Blues, specifically <laughs> Jack Quinn and Keenan, messed that up. He's the Babe Ruth of the sport. He is. And you had him. You had him to finish his career here in St. Louis, and he still was pretty good with the Rangers. He That's still was thing. putting up points. He he, I, he had, I, I think, a 90-point season in his last NHL season, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it, it was great either way. It, he, he didn't just fall off the cliff and wind up having like a 30-point season. He, he was great in his last year. I remember his first game in St. Louis, and... They're playing the national anthem, and the place literally is rocking. I've never heard it as loud than that night. And we've seen some great moments there, no doubt. And even I, I was at a couple of the Stanley Cup games, and it got loud, very, very loud. Mm -hmm. I've never heard it like that, though. He had tears streaming down mm -hmm. his face, and the, the video board had him there. I got goosebumps thinking about it. They're playing the national anthem, and... It was like, we have Wayne Gretzky yeah. here in St. Louis? Mm. How did that happen? It was awesome. It was great. It was great. Uh, by the way, in Gretzky's second to last season, he was first in the league in assists. He had a 90-point season in his second to last season. Then it was nine goals, 53 assists, 62 points in his last NHL season. I saw a thing on Twitter yesterday where Dan Kelly made the call. I can't remember which team it was against, but you were one of the questions was about, uh, was it power play goals or shorthanded goals? But he had nine shorthanded goals with like, four months to go in the yeah. season. It was unbelievable. Yeah, that, oh Hully gosh. always gives him trouble because Hully didn't do uh, empty netters, and Gretzky was always on the ice because they always trusted him uh, to, to get the empty netters. Yep. Especially in his first seven seasons, what he was able to do. I mean, what, where do you guys put him when it comes to the greatest of all time talk in all of sports? Relative to the rest of 
the players in the sport, he is number one, and I don't think it's close. I agree. And you gave the great stat about points and goals. And then they go down and, and people say, well, you know, what about guys that won championships? Well, he did that. Mm -hmm. He checked that box. He won MVPs. <laughs> I mean, he did just about everything you could ask in a in a, a career, and that's what made him incredible. He was unbelievable. Uh, that is our uh, discussion about Wayne Gretzky here on 101 ESPN. Coming what's, up, what's Matthew got going? You're you're laughing out loud here. This one I just texted in: <laughs> Keenan should be tarred and feathered. <laughs> it's 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 the most inexplicable thing. If you weren't alive or conscious, like I was alive when it happened, but I wasn't conscious really. It's when you learn about what happened <laughs> with the Keenan and the and the Gretzky and the Blues thing. It, it never stops like shocking you. Every Every time you relearn about no, it, it's unbelievable. It's insane. And, and Jack Quinn let it's it the happen. Greatest effort. And you had the other part Just of it was it when Keel Center Partners, which was essentially Civic Progress, they pulled the rug out under uh, Mike Shanahan and took ownership of the team. And he was out, and they had just hired Mike Keenan, and Keenan's in charge, and he loves power, and there was no checks or balances. Right. And so if Mike Shanahan is there as the owner of the Blues still, then there are checks and balances, and he'll say, no, Mike, we shouldn't do this. But uh, Keenan did because nobody was going to tell him no. Nope. Mm -hmm. And uh, he made so many trades and then so many deals that just didn't work out. I remember his final game in St. Louis. It was a Sunday afternoon against Vancouver. They lost nine to nothing, mm -hmm. nine to nothing. And I went down and got the post game audio, which was used in one of the issues that they had with Mike Keenan. I mean, it was it was incredible. And how he tried to control the media, how he tried to control the team, make the decisions with the team. Ouch. Yeah, it was it was even though they were making the playoffs, it was not a great time for Blues fans coming up. MLS season starts for City tomorrow. They've already played CONCACAF. Now they start the MLS season tomorrow against Real Salt Lake. We'll preview it for you next time, 101 ESPN.
Hey everyone, it's Brooke here, and I want to tell you about why I enjoy Metro tra Transit so much, and that is because I just think that public transportation is super important to not only just here in St. Louis, but it helps the region as well. Also, to get over to a Blues game, maybe a City SC game, or even a Cardinals game this season, it's super easy to do. You can just hop on the Metro link, and it's only five dollars for an all-day pass, Randy. And it's so cool to be able to not only take Metro to games, but to use it for a beautiful weekend like we have coming up. If you want to go over to Forest Park, if you want to check out the museums, if you want to check out the Central West End, all you have to do is hop on Metro. You don't have to hassle with parallel parking. You don't have to hassle with any of the issues that you have in driving around in traffic. All you have to do is hop on Metro, hop off, and you are where you need to be. We have a great, a great public transportation system here in St. Louis, and it is Metro. If you haven't used it, you should, and if you aren't somebody who does use it, well, uh, Talk to people that do because they'll tell you really good things about Metro. It's a wonderful way to get around St. Louis. And with Metro, you don't have to drive to thrive. Here's the thing. I think we're excited, you know, for sure. Now we get, you know, a chance to get points on the board, especially at home, um, and and to, you know, kick off our regular season. Uh, we're looking to start in in, in the best foot, you know, possible, um, and get the result and uh, move on from there. We got a tight schedule, so, you know, um, it's always a bit of a pickle. But we put ourselves in that situation and and gladly and voluntarily so because uh, the team succeeded, they deserve to be playing on on all fronts this season. So. Yeah, yeah, we're enjoying this process and uh, match day one of the regular season. Excited. That is head coach Bradley Cardell of St. Louis City SC. SC opened against Houston with the CONCACAF action on Wednesday night, and now they open their MLS season against Real Salt Lake tomorrow night over at City Park. And they already have that momentum going. And last year they had that first win against Austin in their first game. Nice to have that win against Houston under their belt, even though it's not an official MLS game, as they open up their regular MLS season tomorrow. And you're going to face, what did you call them? Real? Real. Real Salt Lake. Not the fake Salt Lake. No, salt this lake. is the real this is, Salt Lake. This is the real <laughs> deal yep. happening over there. Yeah. And they have a chance to, uh, I, I would think, they're, they're picked anywhere from 4th to 10th in the preseason rankings, but they've got Berkey back. They've got, uh, and you never know, if, if Klaus is healthy, how different is last year? They can win the West this year. You could tell the other night when Klaus was back in the lineup what a different team that they looked like. 17 home games beginning this weekend and uh, it's a long season you play 34 but 17 uh, starting at home for stl city and the extensions of lutz and carnell tell you a lot about what they expect the next couple of years i, I think that's a good thing it, they have continuity in any sport from your top voices that's a big deal Lutz, especially keeping him around, what he's been able to build and what he's able to bring over. And maybe you can jump on in this, Rock, but why do you think that he wants to say? Because obviously he's somebody who's going to have suitors from not just here in the MLS, but also other places in the world. Uh, yeah, Ben Fred's piece uh, up on STL today actually had had a couple great quotes from Lutz when he when he uh, ran it down, and I uh, just 
I mean, he said it himself, his job isn't done here. He, he brought something. He started it with a five-year plan. He's now saying it's now a six-year plan. And, and that's the big thing. He said, when I came, there was nothing. It's a big part of me and the other way around. You can't judge what we did after one season. There needs to be more time. I think when you build something from the ground up, there gets to be a point where you want to see it through. And for him, he, want, he wants to see trophies before he leaves. It, it, Benford also... I mean, Europe and, quote-unquote, multiple Saudi clubs that called upon his services. Clearly, it's not just about money with this guy. He clearly wants to build something and finish the job. And that's what I like about Lutz is that he is willing to stick to what he said. And the way that they're building up soccer culture here in St. Louis, of course, you already have a great soccer history and culture here, but the way that they're investing into the city in so many different ways, including with their youth, that's the part that is most important to me. They showed the other night that uh, they're going to have the exact same philosophy that he told us he was going to have last year. And Mm -hmm. it seems like what you're saying, Brooke, he's implemented a system and he wants to see it through. And and it's not just a system on the field, but he's got a way of developing talent. He loves being able to go around here and find the the young talent for City 2 and uh, for the academy. It seems like he's all in on building not just a team, but a program. I think the other thing, too, it's that uh, in credit to him, this is not all about the money. Mm-hmm. He's comfortable here. I'm sure his situation and his private life and uh, public life are different, which is the case for anybody that's a coach. But he's probably very comfortable with St. Louis away from coaching. And I think the other thing is is that uh, he's got a pretty good situation here. Yeah. You know, you win last year. You, you've got a long leash then, uh, even if you don't have success, to get things turned around. Rock, two questions for you. One, are we close to seeing Dewyer? here soon and also what about kojima are we going to also see more of him after that performance better jose yeah that's that's kind of the big question going into saturday and then the quick turnaround back in houston on tuesday which is how much of a rotation is going to be in the lineup and i think i think it's a pretty safe assumption that do your if not starting on saturday will probably get you know 30 30 40 minutes on saturday same thing i bet we see leuven who was on the bench and came in late in the game i bet we see him start wouldn't be shocked if we see uh nielsen also start in the back four because those guys again were just a little bit out of fitness because it took them a little bit longer to get their green cards back home than they mm-hmm. thought it would so they didn't get to play in the preseason as much so yeah and then if, if jose if he, I mean, he's coming off the bench for just four minutes in a Concacaf champions cup when it's tied then you're bringing him on probably in this in the 70 75th minute i would guess against real salt like it wouldn't shock me at all all right cdsc tomorrow night at city park and uh you'll have an opportunity to enjoy another great season of st louis city sc soccer coming up they said what here on 101 ESPN.
Hey everyone, it's Brooke here, and this year we decided it was time to make a major upgrade to our home, and that is by updating our main bathroom. Look, we have this house in Youth City. We absolutely love it. It's over a hundred years old, but we didn't exactly love our bathroom. But this is the first time we've ever done a big project like this before, and not sure where to start. We decided to reach out to one of our great sponsors here of 101 ESPN, and that is EMB Granite. EMB Granite's team visited our house for a free consultation, and they sketch out a vision of how to really just transform our bathroom. My favorite part of working with EMB Granite was stopping by their showroom to explore their large selection of in stock custom countertops and cabinet options. They had so many options to choose from, and Jen was fantastic. She really just helped us get this great vision going and also helped us with a vision that fit within our budget. And that's what they do there at EMB Granite. They have been turning visions into realities for over 20 years. So schedule your free consultation today by calling 314 645 9300 or go online to embgranite.com or stop by their amazing showroom today and make sure you mention that I sent you. This is Rocky with your Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The Blues, big win last night over the Islanders, four to nothing, sends us into a packed sports weekend here around the St. Louis area. As the Blues will face off against the Red Wings tomorrow, it's 11 a.m. Uh, puck drop, so you can catch the pregame show right here on 101 ESPN, starting at 10 a.m. and that kicks off a big day. As you have Missouri and Arkansas basketball tipping off at 11 a.m., you have the split squad game for the Cardinals against the Marlins and the Mets, respectively. Uh, first pitch at 12.05 and 12.10 respectively there. Iowa and Illinois at 1.15 and then George Washington and St. Louis at 2 p.m. and then it all finalizes on Saturday night with St. Louis City kicking off their MLS start to the season against Real Salt Lake with a 7.30 game. That is your Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your road to shop 24-7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? about man what you talking about what the hell are you talking about what you talking about do you actually listen to yourself when you speak or do you find you drift in and out what you talking about well, i'm out man welcome back to the opening drive brooke randy and dan here and it is time for they said what? <laughs> Randy, I like when you try it. Let's do that again. We're, it's kind of like our Yoho, right? Yeah, right. They said, <laughs> what? what? Dan? Like what? Yes, <laughs> there, we there we go. All right, well, for today's edition of They Said What, will the Diamondbacks leave Arizona? Well, D-backs owner Ken Kendrick ruffled some feathers this week when he was asked that question. Here is his response. Well, we... <laughs> We, we aren't having those conversations. There, there are opportunities available. You know, there are other cities that would covet having Major League Baseball. I mean, it's not like I'm, you know, speaking out of school to say that. And those names are they're prominent cities uh, that would love to have a Major League team. We're not in dialogue with those communities, but, you know, we, we are aware of what is going on. There, there is likely to be in time an expansion of our sport to a couple of additional cities. Cities are letting uh, MLB know their interest. Their interest in getting a team is specific. Uh, they would be happy with a brand new franchise, but they would certainly be very happy, you know, with frankly a successful existing franchise. It's not where we are spending time or energy. Uh, uh, we may run out of time in Phoenix. We hope that won't happen. Uh, you know, we're, you know, we're hard at it. We're continuing to have meetings. We've ramped up the uh, dialogue in every way that we know how, uh, and we'll continue to do that. We, we, do, we, do still, uh, we do still have conversations with local interested parties. 
It's just a, you know, it's a math problem with anything, right? But we, we still do take the phone calls and take the meetings, but we have been focused on, on Chase. That was a little bit of damage control right there at the end, because if you saw his face, you kind of realized that that was not going over well, what Ken Kendrick said. But that's quite the message from the organization to the Arizona community. Is that a threat to move the team, guys? A hundred percent. I mean, it's going to hold taxpayers hostage with this, which is what they probably want is somewhat of a publicly financed stadium. They're also dealing with hockey and I'm sure there's places like Montreal, Nashville, somewhere in Mexico, San Antonio, Vegas, if it doesn't work out with the Oakland A's where they'll, they'll use that as leverage to say, get us a new stadium. That's what they want. They want a brand new stadium. Mm -hmm. A couple of things. Number one, I think he's stretching a little bit just because they went to the World Series last year to say it's a highly successful organization. That helps. You're right. Uh, to go on the recency yeah. of winning. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And the other part of it is, if you're Rob Manfred, it's one thing to leave Oakland where you have the Giants eight miles away. You can't leave the number 10 market that's probably going to be the number 7 market within a decade. You can't let a team leave that market. And the Cardinals threatened to go across the river and wound up building their own stadium. Ken Kendrick has a lot of money. And I don't know why, especially out there, he wouldn't be able to participate on a higher level in building his own stadium. And that stadium is 25 years old. The franchise started in 98. It's 25 years old. You can't tell me that Ken Kendrick and his ownership group can't find a way to make Chase Field palatable for them. The ballpark there is enormous for baseball. It's way too big mm -hmm. for baseball. And remember when they first started in 98, the place was packed. But it needs to be more of an intimate setting. And I think one of the problems that they have is that, and it's kind of like what's going on with Tampa Bay and Miami and what's happening now with Arizona, so many transplants that have no connection to that particular team. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's somebody from Minnesota and Missouri and all these people move mm -hmm. out to warm weather climates and they have zero connection to the team, which is something that they have to battle. But winning and continuing to invest your team will always bring in new fans. I think it is interesting because it is the fourth oldest ballpark in the National League. And that is the big debate here is the renovations. It's supposed to be estimated 500 million is what the renovations will look like. Is, are they just wanting help? And that's what he was trying to do there is to try to push people to help them out in this situation. I get the sense that they want a new stadium. I know yeah. that they're talking about upgrades, but all of the rumbling leading up to this has been that they want a replacement for Chase Field. This has been going on for three years, like mm -hmm. the little stuff that slips out and, you know, little mild threats to move the franchise. Again, I, I think you're just trying to hold the community hostage and saying we have to get something publicly funded to mm -hmm. make sure that we stay in Arizona. And we should note that for a long time, the football Cardinals couldn't get a stadium because the folks in the Valley of the Sun wouldn't vote for funding for a stadium. The Arizona Coyotes are probably going to move because they've at every turn been shot down by the public. A vote in Tempe last spring prevented them from getting started on a new arena for the Coyotes, and they're probably going to wind up moving. And it could happen in the very near future that Arizona, if these threats are carried out, the 10th market in the country could only have two teams. Wow. I, I thought they were having an issue, and I don't know if you just mentioned I was looking at something on the text line, but what about the Suns? Are they having an issue, too? Yeah, but the Suns are number one there. They'll get what they want. Okay. If there's a public vote for something that the Suns want, and they did get upgrades to uh, their arena, but if the Suns want something, they're number one in that town. From the 3 and 4 is it a coincidence that, that the Coyotes don't have a stadium either? No, uh, for the reasons that we, well, number one, terrible ownership. The Coyotes' ownership is the worst in the NHL, and it's probably not even close. They've had, what, like four or five different owners here in the yeah. last uh, 10 years? Yep. And they don't win. They, yep. they, they never win. And for the same reasons that you talked about with baseball, hockey, you need ev even a more lo loyal local fan base because uh, nobody's got a reason to be a Coyotes fan. So you, what you've got is people coming from other cities that are going to their games. But th what they need to do is concentrate on the product. What the Coyotes need to do is concentrate on the product, and that might help. But I think they've kind of run out of runway there. Used to be packed at yeah, Coyotes yep. games. Um, I think of Pierre Turgeon in game seven in mm -hmm. overtime beating the Coyotes, and they had Jeremy Roenick, they had Keith Kachuk, they had Nikolai Habibulin. They had good players, mm -hmm. and people were coming out. It also was newer to 
I mean, the Valley of the Sun having hockey, Mm -hmm. you know, it was kind of a a new thing to go do. But now you watch it and they're playing in, you know, basically a, what, 5,000 seat arena, whatever it is. I I just think it's another veiled threat to taxpayers to try to get involved and help them fund that stadium. And I just think that's always the wrong way to go about that. And he was asked that in that follow-up question. If you could see the reaction of their faces with that, it it was just kind of shocking because everybody is realizing as he kept talking about what Ken Kendrick was saying. And he was asked the follow-up question, is that a threat to move the team? And he said, I don't think that the world we live in, threats are the right way to do business. We're a community people. Our franchise is a part of the fabric of Arizona. We call it Chase field reimagine that as our hope at the moment but it's kind of hard to understand that when you heard the way that he phrased it prior to that it is a veiled threat he come out and say what he said I, I, <laughs> if i'm a, 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 a somebody that loves the arizona diamondbacks i'm like really you yeah. know what i mean if i'm part of that community really you're gonna come out and say this i mean that that just starts the the conversation a little bit more when you get guys on the record saying the things that he just said i don't like it by the way, the uh, the Diamondbacks have made the playoffs twice in the last 12 years. The Coyotes have made the playoffs once in the last 11 years. That's really a tough way to engender goodwill to try to get funding for a new stadium. This is interesting. 618 says it's crazy that the Jets leave for Arizona. And now we're talking about the Coyotes leaving and Winnipeg is also having problems. And they're talking about leaving, too. I just don't think you should or can leave Canadian markets. Well, it doesn't seem right. No, it doesn't. And oh, by the way. This is something where Rob Manfred has to come walk in and say, go on a radio station out there or say to one of their prominent writers, say, the Diamondbacks aren't going anywhere. I don't care what Ken Kendrick says. The Diamondbacks aren't going anywhere. I wonder if expansion would curtail their effort to do. I mean, there's going to be cities that are out there, Montreal, Nashville, as I said, maybe in Mexico, Charlotte. Puerto Rico, maybe even mm-hmm. just to no. put a team there. I, mm-hmm. I I don't know. I Salt Lake City. I, Salt Lake City be another one. San Antonio maybe mm-hmm. would be another one. Uh, there'll be options, but if they want to expand, it it just doesn't look good when you have teams switching markets right and left. It's it's not good for the sport. No, no not at all. We know it all too well. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes. And that was the amazing thing about the Rams: how much mm-hmm. public money you're going to get, and how the. Uh, owners had no clue the the rest of the owners just had no clue whatsoever that is they said what (laughs) coming up next we're going to head down the stretch with a rock and roll here on 101 espn
Looking for more ways to play? Underdog Fantasy has their newest Pick'em product, and it's active in Missouri. It's Pick'em Champions. You just pick two to five players from at least two different teams, select higher or lower on the player stat projections, and then you're entered in with other underdogs to win some money. My favorite part about Underdog Fantasy is they always have me ready with any game I want to play. I was playing NHL and NBA last night. No blues tonight, so I'm going to stay away from the NHL. I'm going to go with the NBA entry. In fact, let's build an entry like now. We're going to do three entries combined. They're all going to be points, assists, and rebounds. We're going to go low Lower on Anthony Simmons, 34.5. Lower on Kaminga. It's going to be a tough game for them against a hot Charlotte team. I'm going to go lower on 25.5. And Giannis, he's been struggling lately. I'm going to go lower on him, 45.5. Now, here's the key to Underdog Fantasy. They're always putting up bonuses on the app. So what you need to do is you need to follow them on Twitter because they're going to be putting up an NBA bonus. So you take those three parts on your entry and you add in a fourth one a little bit later. So you're going to take your 10x entry and you're going to make it worth even more. A little bit later on today when they release their specials on the NBA because they're doing it every day. That's one of my favorite things about Underdog Fantasy. It's super easy to play and even easier to get started. Just go to their easy-to-use mobile app or to underdogfantasy.com. Sign up with promo code ROCC and Underdog will match your first deposit up to $100. Plus, they'll give you a mystery special pick to use on your first pick em entry. That's Underdog Fantasy promo code ROCC to get your first deposit of $10 or more up to $100 matched plus that special pick. Must be 18 plus and present in a state where Underdog Fantasy operates. Terms apply. Consumer, you play call 100 Gambler. Visit www.ncbgambling.org. And roll. Let's rock. Let's rock today. We've got a balloon party team back in Ajax coming up, and then we've got BK and Ferrario 11 to 2. Top rated BK and Ferrario. And then from 2 to 6, you've got uh, the, the fast lane. Top rated fast lane, too. So congratulations to all of those guys. Matthew, what do you got for us on... What's uh, that say about us? <laughs> uh, I'm blaming Just the competition. Just be better, right? Just be yeah. better. Dan, I only trust the numbers when they're good. That's right. <laughs> well done, Randall. Thank you. Radio vet right there. <laughs> Sonny Gray had the most effective sweeper in Major League Baseball last year. You know what? In 1968, <laughs> Bob Gibson had the most effective sweeper. <laughs> Did they call it a sweeper back then? No, but it was. <laughs> Same thing. Oh, sorry. I wasn't supposed to. Okay. <laughs> Whoopsies. Um, Sergio Romo made a career out of the sweeper. <laughs> sure did. You know what? Speaking of baseball, I love that Major League Baseball has found a way to us to get to get to know the players. Honestly, more than I ever really thought I wanted oh, to. No. I wanted to. Um, oh, no. Because if you guys have seen the new pants for these uh, Fanatic slash Nike jerseys, you're going to learn some things about these players because... The pants are see-through. Let's just cut out all the, all the, all the, the pants are see-through and they got to fix it by now. And, and, and listen, it's not just that the pants are see-through. It's also that apparently they're having supply problems. There was a port, report yesterday that an MLB player had to tell his equipment manager to go to Dick's Sporting Goods to buy more versions of the pants because they're not sure if they're going to have enough of them. I literally said you could pull the jerseys Bang. off the racks at Dick's Sporting <laughs> Goods. You're not, you're and, not and wrong. Here's the thing. It, it's also getting cosmetically bad. There was a photo shoot yesterday where players at the exact same photo shoot for the same team in the same jersey mm. had two different cuffs at the end of their sleeve. Two completely different style of cuffs. I understand that this was apparently this, the deal started with the All-Star jerseys last year. But apparently making two teams worth of jerseys was much simpler than making 30, two, 30 teams worth of jerseys because they blew it. Like, can we at this point yes. say they screwed this up? The, the, the sleeves are wrong. The, num the, the, the names are too small for a fan to see them from anywhere but immediately off the field. And the pants are see-through, and it's going to get kind of creepy. Like, they, they screwed this one up. And as Greg said yesterday on the, this show, it might not be the thing that changes it, 
but the M Major League Baseball does listen to their fans. So keep making fun of them all over Twitter because hopefully just pure embarrassment causes a switch. Pro tip for the marketing people at Don't MLB. Ready? Oh, no. no. I'm so scared. Several celebrity softball game. If you don't have the pants fixed by the All-Star game, don't invite Pete Davidson to the celebrity oh. All-Star all game. You wow. You can't invite Drake either. No, no. <laughs> John Ham's out. No, no, oh, right. no. Yep. Okay, what do you mean? Guys. I don't get it, guys. No, 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 Dan. Go ahead and no, it. no follow up questions, <laughs> please, saying. Dan. No, 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 no. Let's just no. say those guys use a longer bat. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh. Boy, it was fun working with you guys. <laughs> We're talking about a, a great, softball game. In, a great it's, weekend. It's a great, great weekend, everybody. Um, no, any... I'm not talking about the weekend. I'm talking about ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is uh, this is interesting. But it does bring up a very good point about the quality when you're talking about that. Do they realize that these guys play during the summertime when it gets really, really hot and people sweat a lot? Yeah. And what do you have? What happens with rain games? Noonday sun. Yeah, not I have good. a lot of concerns. <laughs> I'm just how saying. Furious, Daniel, remember this? How furious people got when Albert Pujols would wear a black undershirt? Oh, sure. So now you've got see-through jerseys and a black undershirt. People will go crazy. I, I'll tell you, the other one is that if a coaching staff wears the hoodies, oh yeah, people don't like that either. They want to see the manager and the coaching staff in the players or the the team's uniform mm -hmm. belt see that see the piping see the top see the birds on the bat they don't want to see anybody with the hoodies they don't like that i at all can i be honest i don't like the hoodies on the managers i and i know that ollie does do it i didn't really like that in honor of rick hummel he made sure to wear just the full uniform I, I don't like the sweatshirts. But as guys, the if the hoodies. jerseys are so bad though That's because they're uncomfortable and they're, they're not well, now. well yeah so now I don't blame them going for comfort, right? You, you got to make your players comfortable. That's number hey, hey, one. Manager. Can you imagine Lou Pinella <laughs> screaming at an umpire in these fanatic jerseys? Oh, man. He burst the seam. <laughs> yeah, he um, would. Also, one other thing, I need to bring this up just because um, I'm going to tear. Jackson needs to be uh, held oh, accountable no. for what happened yesterday oh, on the yeah. balloon party. Ouch. So my question for you guys, I'm not going to completely throw Jackson under the uh, under the bus here, but is there any sporting event, if you had access to a time machine, that you would go to other than the Miracle on Ice? Would there be one that you would put above the Miracle on Ice? If you could be in the stands at Lake Placid, power of a time machine, would there be any other sporting event you would put above that? No, there's mm -hmm. not. Jackson, Jackson Burkett yeah. yesterday said that he would go to the NBA All-Star Game from this season <laughs> before he would go to Lake Placid for the Miracle on Ice game. There's no Spoken way he was like serious about that. Somebody that has never been maybe had access to that game or gone on YouTube. Or, aware. Here's the thing, that still doesn't <laughs> yeah. matter. Like, he was joking. Please tell me he was joking. Well, I, uh, Jackson's very adamant about his love of the round ball. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> but I, I, but the way that you guys were talking about it being the most important sporting event of your childhood, I was like, I got, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take Jackson down here, but I'm also gonna frame him with a good question, because, because I wasn't alive for it, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm thinking that that'd probably be what I would choose as well. The NBA All Star Game? No, no. <laughs> No, Ooh, the goodness. first ever dunk no. contest when Michael Jordan. No, no. Yeah. Highest, it would be like plastic. Yeah. Highest impact sports moment of my life, without question. And all you have to do is watch the movie Miracle. It's a Disney movie, for gosh sakes. And you can see, because it's very accurate, about what was going on in our country. It was a hugely impactful time, especially when they beat the Soviet Union. And I would choose that over everything else. I uh, was thinking about this, certainly would not put it ahead of that, but just the patriotism of Whitney Houston singing the national anthem Ooh. before the uh, the Bills I was there. and the Giants. Were you really? Mm -hmm. Really? Oh yeah. What was it like? It was unbelievable. They had Black Hawk helicopters on yep. each corner of the, the stadium. Or, uh, just They stayed there for the whole game. And uh, uh, people were it was very unifying people were waving flags and crying because it was such a, an incredibly emotional rendition of the anthem during wartime uh, it was amazing yeah it was great looked uh, just incredible i remember watching on tv i remember looking to people i was with in my living room and they were crying yeah mm -hmm. watching it yeah. so it was impactful she, she was great by the way I would pick 500 sporting events over this year's <laughs> NBA All-Star Game. Thank maybe, you. Maybe 1,000. That's why <laughs> I can't believe he said that. Maybe 2,000. I'll, yeah. I'll admit that being at the dunk contest where Jordan went from the free throw line would be pretty high up in my 
a list of events to go back in time for. It would be pretty high up there, but I don't think there's any single All Star game that I, I that I would put up there. Yeah, no, like maybe like the, the yeah, to be you. in the locker room when 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 uh, for the first like if you can put me in the locker room when Larry Bird pulls out the who's getting second line. Yeah, that's oh, good. Yeah. That, that'd be in a top five immediately. Yeah. But I don't know if it's beating out Lake Placid. Yeah. No, and certainly mm. not the four hundred. Even even the commissioner didn't like the NBA. <laughs> yeah. <All-Star game> the <laughs> well, he scored the most points. Uh, thank you, Matthew. That's our producer uh, audio video engineer, the one, the only Matthew Rocchio. Pleasure. Brooke, did you have fun today? Yes. Show your face. We want to see your face. Who said that? You want to see my face? Good. Daniel, have a great weekend, brother. Pleasure. Oh, you have a great weekend, too. Oh, uh, Chick-fil-A. Wait a damn minute. Love, well done. Pleasure. Well, everybody says it's that at Chick-fil-A. Pleasure. Why not do it here? Yeah. It's good. Hey, we thank you for tuning in, texting in, and being a part of the show. For all of us, until Monday morning at 7, have a great weekend, St. Louis. That's right.